Uh, uh, what's up, everybody? Uh, meet again. Meet again. You're tuned in to Jamming Out All Badass. I'm Francisco, of course. Probably know that by now. If you've watched these, if you haven't watched any of these, welcome. Appreciate you stopping by and checking the show out. Uh, you know, it's it is live. We are live, but uh, sometimes a lot of people, you know, majority of the people catch it later on. So, if you're one of those people, I'm talking to you in the future right now. Uh, appreciate you checking it out. Also, uh, been been cool. Been a lot of fun. Uh, what's up, Sam, Iris, Tom? Uh, good to have you guys here. Uh, you know, you guys are just as psyched as I am to have to talk to Mike. Um, so, again, uh, thanks everybody for supporting the, the show, the channel. Um, as you just read on the bottom there, uh, support the channel by uh, telling everybody about it, subscribing, all that, liking, commenting afterwards uh, about the show. Uh, telling everybody about it, please. Uh, appreciate everybody doing that. Uh, before we get uh, bring Mike out here, I got a show coming up saturday uh it's gonna be a special start time it's one o'clock because i will be talking to her from filthy christians some of you guys may have uh may have know who filthy christians are they had an album out on earache uh called mean way back in 89 90. uh so Pear, the vocalist, is uh, going to be joining me. That's going to be cool. It's going to be at 1 o'clock uh, Central Time, uh, but 2 o'clock Eastern. Um, one of my favorites from back, from back then. Uh, all that early classic gear ache stuff. Uh, you know, if you know it, you know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, it's going to be cool talking to him. Uh, love Filthy Christians. He was also a protest band. And uh, he's got a new, uh, I guess, newer band called Sex Dwarf. Uh, which is like really heavy, like noisy, you know, Swedish punk, uh, just like just like all the old stuff. Uh, so, looking forward to doing that. So, uh, Saturday, one p.m. Central, two Eastern. Um, so, anyhow, um, won't be uh, talking too much on the intro today. Uh, Actually, next week, I don't know if I'm going to do a show or not after Saturday. Uh, Got to do some recordings with uh, Cemetery and uh, my, one of my bands. We're going we're trying to finish up some splits we're doing. So we're going to be recording next sometime next week. So I probably won't be doing any shows, which is fine. Gives everybody a time to uh, check out all the old ones. So do that. Check them all out, man. They've all been cool. Bunch of cool people. Real cool guests. Uh, including uh, tonight's guest. So, uh, anyhow, how's everybody out there doing? See a few people already showing up. Uh, share the share the uh, share the links right now. Tell everybody to get over here uh, on your pages or wherever you're watching. But uh, yeah, so let me uh, let me uh, rank, let me share something real quick. Something cool. Let me see. Where'd he go? Here we go. Here we go. Bring Mike on. Check this out. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Check it out. Thank you. 
Yeah. How cool was that? All right. So uh, we'll talk about that here shortly. So uh, my guest today really doesn't need, needs no introduction if you're into extreme uh, <laughs> underground music. Uh, true, prime, true pioneer uh, of this underground music that we all like and love. Uh, dating way back to the early 80s with uh, Morbid Angel and uh, also been in the mighty incubus at one point, uh, way back, and Nocturnus, Nocturnus AD, amongst the other ones. So please, please welcome Mr. Mike Browning. How you doing, Miss? How you doing, Mike? All right. How you doing, Francisco? I'm not not too bad, man. I appreciate you uh, uh, joining me today. It's uh, it's an honor to it's an honor to have you on the show. So uh, I think we, we talked a little bit about it. I've been following your stuff for since I was a kid. So. Um, Appreciate you coming on. Uh, let's talk about that, that that video I just showed. Uh, you know, a lot of people may not know that uh, you've been doing that those types of, like animation things for a couple of years. You care? Uh, can you sh uh, talk a little bit about that, please, sir? Uh, yeah, that that's actually um, an animation of a fractal. Uh, it's it's a program called Mandelbulb 3D, and it's actually a free program, so it's kind of fun to mess around with. And and um, even though fractals are based in mathematics you don't really have to know anything like that you just uh there's several different types of fractals and and you pick a fractal out and yeah. you just kind of like it's like a zoom in kind of thing and you can change parameters and um you know change the fractal around and then you can zoom really far into the fractal uh you can i've done some of them where like you can go in uh, like into one pixel of that fractal and even zoom into that one pixel, like wow. 500%. It's, it's really crazy. So I, I kind of discovered that program and I really liked it and the weirdness of it. And, and, you know, it's like every time you play around with it, you find something new. Yeah. And it's, it's like exploring more than anything. And that's why I really, really like it. And it, the animation, um, the only problem with that is it takes a while. So that's about yeah. 1500 frames, I think right there. And it took like, I left it on my computer for like three days. <laughs> oh, wow. It's, yeah. It, it's really slow with animation. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but it, it turns out pretty nice once it's done. It just yeah. takes a while uh, for the animation part. If you're just going to explore the fractal and, and get like a one, a one picture type of render out of it, it doesn't yeah. take long. You can do that, you know, all, almost live. So it's, it's kind of fun. You know, I, I discovered the program a few years ago. And uh, yeah, I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask how long that I, I knew it takes a long time to to make like fifteen seconds of animation. So I imagine it takes takes a while for it to to come together or to well, complete. That, I guess that one is extremely slow. But like if you're doing something like an Unreal Engine, the um the animation is almost uh is it's really close to like real time now. It's crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it looks cool. I was like. Uh, when I when I, I think I had come across a couple of the ones you had done, I was like, man, that's that's cool stuff. Like I mentioned, it's like a, that was just totally Nocturnus, uh, uh, you know, vibe, like like we talked about before. But uh, yeah, it's really cool stuff. I figured I'd share that. Maybe a lot of people, maybe they do, maybe they don't know that, you know, some of the other things that you do other than, uh, you know, creating evil music. <laughs> I have a YouTube channel, so I got you know several fractals that I did, and, and I use a. Uh, a, a software synth and make the music, you know, the sound, I shouldn't say music cause that's not really music there, but uh, it's like, you know, the soundtrack to it. And, oh, okay. And, that's and, awesome. I'm so I do all, all the sound as well, you know, to, to are you, uh, is your YouTube channel just Mike Browning? Yep. Okay. Awesome. So everybody go check his stuff out uh, on the YouTube, youtube.com Mike Browning. You can't spell Mike Browning. Well, uh, I may, I'll, I'll, you know, just look at the, uh, Look at the little uh, ticker on the bottom there. Uh, it tells you. <laughs> so I don't know if you run the, uh, the the Instagram or not, but if anybody wants to go check out the Nocturnus AD Instagram, there's the uh, there's a handle there at Nocturnus AD. So uh, you know, go, go support the band. Uh, so 
I guess it's been a couple of years now since Paradox came out, right? Yeah, it's already been two years now. It's hard to believe. Uh, just, to, I, you know, COVID just messed everything up. I mean, we had totally. uh, festivals planned for, you know, the summer of 2019, and they got changed to 2020. I mean, 2021, and now they're getting changed to 2022, which I think everything's going to be opened back up by next summer. But yeah. it, it really put everything behind, and and you know we 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 usually only practice like on Saturdays anyway. So it, it does take us since we only practice once a week. It's kind of hard um, to write a whole album uh, stuff just seeing each other once in a week, yeah. and then you know, with five guys, sometimes somebody doesn't show up, and then you have to spend the next week teaching them what you learned the week before. You know what you wrote. Yeah. So, but we, we're actually working on the next album and we've got, oh. we're working on our eighth new song. So it's coming along really, really good too. I'm, I'm real happy with all the new stuff that we got. Once we, we're going to do another nine songs and then we're going to do one oh, yeah. old, old song from the first demo that. Uh, oh, really? Gonna, Which one? Um, uh, Unholy Fury or The Entity? No, those two were actually Vince's songs and oh. they were redone uh, in Asheron. Um, oh, yeah. Vince, yeah, yeah had a band called Entity before he even joined Nocturnus. And uh, so when Vince joined Nocturnus in 1987, and he was playing guitar. Uh, he had a whole bunch of songs from Entity. So we incorporated all those songs into the early Nocturnus versions. And yeah. that's why Entity and uh, Unholy Fury were on there. But when, once, um, when Vince left and moved up north, he, he, you know, he kept all his songs that were his, even though, they became early Nocturna songs. Yeah. He still wrote them. And I was like, well, you know, I, I don't want to keep playing these, you know, you know, so either, you know, so he kind of took those with him. And then when I ended up joining Asheron, you know, we brought a few of those songs back, you know, and it was, it was kind of cool, you know, so we re-recorded those newer, you know, versions of them. So yeah. that's kind of like what happened to that. But uh, there's a song called Nocturnus. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the first song. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, hell yeah, that's a great song. And and when I was uh, when I had after death, we did a version of it on on the uh, on on the Retronomicon uh, CD, right. and uh, so we kind of took both of those versions, kind of put them together, and then put some more new stuff in it, and have a brand new version of it. Because the weird thing with 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 that song Nocturnus, and this is why we did it, is the lyrics. I, I'm I. You know, everybody knows that the key story is like on the key, but it's only like really the key story is only like the last four songs. Right. Um, the other songs before that have their own kind of uh, thing to them, too. And what happened was Lake of Fire and Standing in Blood just seemed to make a little story of their own together. So when I realized Lake of Fire and Standing in Blood kind of make a story uh, yeah. that continues when we did Paradox. Um, I continued that with seizing the throne. Right. So it kind of goes like lake of fire, standing in blood, seizing the throne. And now um, what's really weird is the, so the lyrics to Nocturnus are the fourth song. It's, it's actually what happens after, after uh, seizing the throne. Oh, okay, cool. So, and it, it didn't, it wasn't meant to be that way. Cause that was actually one of the first songs I, I ever wrote lyrics to for Nocturnus was Nocturnus. And, yeah. and you know, I would have never known back then that I would have had Lake of fire and standing and blow. We didn't have any of that stuff back then. So it's kind of funny when I, after I wrote seizing the throne, I was like, wow, the lyrics to Nocturnus are actually the next song. And it kind of completes the story. Yeah, so I said, cool. it'd be kind of cool to do Nocturnus as a bonus track for the next album. And just yeah. have that kind of an extra thing that it probably won't be on the vinyl because I think the vinyl will be too long uh, to do that. So yeah. we're going to you know, have it as an extra bonus track for like the CD and stuff like that. Yeah, I was listening. I was actually listening to Paradox and I know uh, there's like, I think you said four songs on there that kind of tie into to the key album. I guess the Lost, uh, I, I can't remember the song titles now, it's, but like. It's the last four songs again. I did the oh, same. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we did. Um, it's the Annie Chamber, uh, Return of the Lost Key. Um, oh gosh, it's been a while since I've even listened uh, to that. Season of, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, 
can't remember the titles offhand, but uh, and it ends up with uh, Aeon of the Ancient Ones, uh, and kind of like number nine. That's why that was an instrumental, and we didn't really have a name for it. So yeah. it just kind of was like an outro uh, to the story. So mm-hmm. we kind of added that in, and then on this next album, we have four songs again that continue with the story from from the key to paradox to this new album. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been listening. I was I was listening to to the album, and uh, I I think I think it's a it's a it's a damn good album. And I think uh, I remember reading before it even came out, you had talked about uh, you know uh, it being like what the second album from Nocturnus was supposed to be, kind of uh, pretty instead of like thresholds, uh, like uh, paradox would would have been like after the key, uh, and I I mean. I, I think you guys did a hell of a job on that album. Uh, um, being it's been two years now, how do you? How, uh, what, do you what are your thoughts on that album? Two years later. Well, I'm, I, I was. I, I knew we had a, a good sounding record, and and it turned out sounding a lot like the key too, which is was a big thing we were really really looking to do. And you know, of course, continuing so many of the stories off the key. Yeah. It, it, I wanted to do that back then, but then I didn't end up singing on thresholds. So I didn't yeah. end up really, I think I wrote some lyrics. I wrote uh tribal Voodoo and some other stuff, parts yeah. of other songs, but you know, on, on thresholds, I rarely, I barely wrote any of the lyrics uh, on that album. Cause everybody was like, Oh, now that you're not singing, we want to this and that, but really for them, it seemed like more, it was all about, they wanted to get paid more for, for, for writing more and with the key even though i wrote you know me and actually mike davis threw threw in a bunch of you know of lyrics and song titles too on the key some of the more uh later songs um everything that we we did with the key was split between everybody in the band i never was like oh i wrote you know 70% 70% yeah. of the lyrics. So I want 70% of the money. I, I never did anything like that. And I still don't do that. Um, in, in, in Nocturnus AD, I write all the lyrics now, but I, I, I don't take 50% of the royalties, you know, or anything like that. I believe, you know, I mean, with, with this, with paradox, we all, well, especially me and the two guitar players, we sat in there and worked on these songs all together. And, and the first time I, like in Nocturnus, Mike Davis wrote a lot of stuff, you know, most of the songs and, and Gino wrote a lot of stuff too, when he was in the band, but we changed almost every rhythm that he wrote from, if you listen to the difference between science of horror and, and, um, yeah, you know, we changed stuff. Uh, so it wasn't all the same, but I didn't want, uh, and, and, and like with after death, my other band, when Damien was the guitar player in that band, he wrote, most of the guitar rhythms so with paradox we had two guitar players you know damien and belial and i said look this time i want to i want to do something different i don't want you to write a song and bring it in you know i I don't want him to write a song and bring it in or anything like that we're going to sit down in this room the three of us and you're going to throw out a rhythm and we're going to learn it then you're going to throw out a rhythm and we're going to learn it we're going to make those two rhythms fit and then we'll go back and forth so almost every song on paradox is like been it was going back and forth between the two guitar players rhythms and, and it really made the album sound kind of different because of that. You know, yeah, so many albums, you got one guy writing most of the music. Yeah, right. And, right. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that's normal, but I wanted to make sure this was a little different and, and I mean, had it album. worked out. It worked out. I think the album the album's great. And it, it sounds like, an, you know, like, like, like what you guys wanted it to, to, or what you talked about, you know, before it came out, what you were going for. I think it came out great. Yeah, we spent, you know, we luckily we had a lot of time to do that because we've been together for like, you know, I think with Nocturnus AD, well, of course, most of the people were in After Death as well. So some yeah. of us have been together for 12, 13 years. And yeah. you know, even though most of these songs for Paradox were written in the last year before we recorded Paradox, yeah. A lot of it was, you know, just because we played together for so long, we were able to kind of come together and, and we played those Nocturnus songs for a long time uh, live. So it, yeah. it's, it's, we got really used to playing 
the Nocturnus songs, but we would play them in D instead of E flat. Uh, cause on the key, they're in E flat. Hmm. But, but as far as when we would play them live, cause after death music was all in D. So when we would play Nocturnus songs, they were in D. So they still sounded a little weird, a little off. So when, when I decided to do Nocturnus AD again, I said, well, we're going to have to tune back up to E flat and play these songs exactly the way they were in Nocturnus. Yeah. And we pretty much have covered that. And because we did that for so long, we had a pretty good feeling of what we wanted to go for with Paradox. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, well, songs like uh, Procession of the Equinoxes, uh, Apotheosis. I mean, those are just some of the ones that like stood out to me when I was, when I was, I kind of just, you know, revisited it again today just for, to, cause I was going to talk to you, but, uh, I mean, the, 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 the musicianship on that album is just unreal, man. I mean, it's still, it's still, you've always played with, uh, pretty quality musicians and this is no different. So if anybody hasn't heard this album, I mean, uh, get on it. If, if you were a fan of, uh, of like, you know, Nocturnus and even like, Morbid Angel, ah, pick it up because uh, it's pretty damn good. Uh, had somebody say earlier, uh, let me put it back up. Paradox is a masterpiece. There you go. Awesome, awesome. You know, <laughs> you never know. You know, today with all the keyboard warriors out there, and people love to cut cut on things. And oh yeah, it, it's like I, I really wasn't sure what was going to happen with it, and I I never thought that people would actually say it. You know, it's like it's the perfect record to follow the key because the key kind of was just a moment in time. And because keyboards weren't used, it, it kind of like became the first death metal record with keyboards, even though, you know, other people use keyboards before that for sure. Right. Um, it, it just kind of got noted as that. And the status that that album ended up becoming, even though at the time we never really looked at it, that it was going to happen that way. Yeah. Um, it, it was kind of, of a big shoot a fill to to think that paradox was even going to come close to what the key did right. and um, i i saw a lot of reviews and stuff that were people were just like man this is just like hearing it all over again you know you know it's, it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like, like an extension it's, it's it's like a double it's like an extension of that album i think and that's to me that's the biggest compliment you know that i could ever get because that's what we were going for and yeah and, it worked out yeah, when you when you when you you know you never know when you're putting these songs together. You, you don't hear them the same as other people do. Of course, everybody hears yeah. a song differently, and yeah. and you know when you put them together and you spend a lot of time working on them, you kind of get used to them, yeah. and and it's like you're not sure if they're what they are or not. You know, it's kind of it's kind of weird. So it's you know you create them so you have a different opinion about them than than somebody that just buys the record for the first time and puts it on and listens to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I mean, I, 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 for one, am one of those people that are like, eh, I don't know if it's going to work and I, I don't know if it's going to, you know, but hey, I was, I was made a believer. So, uh, and those people that know me know, I, I mean, I just, um, I was just, I, I didn't know what to expect, but, uh, I, it 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 turned out it turned out fucking awesome uh, in in my opinion. So in my opinion matters. And and Jared <laughs> Pritchard too. Um, he Jared Pritchard was you know he engineered it, he produced yeah. it, he he actually uh, you know got a lot out of us. He he's a, a, a perfectionist when it comes to this stuff, and, and, yeah. and he makes things sound really good. And I've known Jared since he he was in a band called Eulogy back in the mid nineties. And he just played guitar back then. He didn't run sound or anything. Yeah. And I lived in an apartment complex before I bought my first house. And he actually lived upstairs uh, from from where I lived. So, you know, we used to hang out quite a bit back then when I lived in those apartments and talk and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden he became really big, you know, mixing wise and, and running live sound for Goat Horror and 1349 and all these great bands. And now he's doing you know, Celtic Frost stuff, you know, well, you know, wh whatever they're being called at the time, but, you know, they're doing Hellhammer stuff too. And he's, you know, doing that. And I mean, he's just doing all the greatest bands that, that we all used to just sit there and listen to the records in an apartment. Yeah. And now he's their sound man. And, you know, to me, um, he's really like done a lot, you know, it's, 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 
And plus he's a fantastic guitar player. So for him, he, he had seen Nocturnus live several times in Tampa. So he, he knew what I was looking for, for sure. And, yeah, and, and, and it just worked out perfect. He, he had just bought a reel to reel tape machine, uh, like, a, like two months before we recorded the album. And when he bought that, I was like, uh, this is, this is like too good to be true, you know? And he's always touring with bands, but he just happened to have this like month long break right at the time we were ready to record. So everything just, the stars completely aligned for that album and everything happened just the way it was supposed to. And then yeah. it was, we recorded and then he had to go on a tour with goat whore and he did a couple small tours after that. So we recorded and then had to take like a two month break uh, before we could mix the record. Cause he just, he was out on the road mm-hmm. and, and cause we squeezed all the recording time in cause he had that one month off luckily. And we got all that on the weekends cause his studio is in Orlando. So we would literally, you know, every weekend we'd drive to Orlando and record and we, we didn't have to like do it all in one week, which was kind of yeah. nice. And then we got to sit back and listen to what we recorded for like two months before he started mixing it. And then, so when he got back off these tours, then he mixed the album, uh, like in December and January. And, and, uh, it was, it was kind of cool because we got, actually, he would, you know, do a little bit of a mix and send it to us. And we're like, okay, turn this up and turn the, you know, it, it, yeah. it worked out really well. Uh, cause we had that time to sit back and listen to the recording before we actually mixed it. And most bands, they have to do everything in like a week or two. So they got yeah. the studio in my book and they have to record and mix and master all in like this two week period or three week period or whatever, you know, it is ends up yeah. being some of them in a one week period. And, and, you know, people are doing albums really fast these days because of equipment wise and, yeah. you know, things like pro tools and things like that. But we, we ended up using the tape machine for, for my drums and, and, and it kind of was like a backwards thing. It was like, instead of using a click track, he took my drums and made them a click track basically. Hmm. And so when he put it in pro tools, the guitar players played to the timing of what I did instead of me playing to a click track. Ah, so yeah, it was kind of cool. Cause it, when you put it in pro tools, then it has to be in some kind of frame basically. I, I'll yeah. say, you know, of timing. So he actually went and wrote set all the sections of the songs and made them a certain timing, you know, and then it, it all went to, it was weird. It was kind of like backwards from the way most people do things. <laughs> but it, it seemed to actually work really well. And it gave the album this feel of, of being recorded back in the eighties or nineties and, and having that live kind of feel to it. And, you know, it, yeah. it was, it was kind of nice being able to do something completely backwards from what most people record with these days. And I think that's why it came out sounding different than most records do these days. Are you going to use him again? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, hopefully uh, we can get these last couple songs written and get everything comfortable enough to, to get another recording out of him before he has to start doing a, a bunch of mega touring because, I'm oh, sure yeah, 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 yeah. you know, that's he's true. been, sitting around recording and doing things like that too. And, you know, that everything's starting to open back up a little bit with the, the live situations. He's going to, he's going to be busy doing a lot of live shows. So we're going to have to squeeze this in, you know, soon, hopefully, uh, you know, but it, 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 we've been taking our time, right. Writing these songs as well. Luckily we had that and our label profound lore. They're, they're really good about everything. It's been the best label that I've been on and everything the label owner, Chris, everything he's promised, he's done that and more. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's like we've been paid on time every time with royalties. I've never seen anything like this out of a record company. You know, it's like, wow, there, there are good record companies out there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to touch on that later, but yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, you know, he hasn't pressed us like, Oh, you know, to get the next record out. He's like, you know, take your time, write it. And I know it's going to be, you know, cool when you guys get it done. So he's really laid back like that. So we don't have a, a time frame to where we have to record it by this date or anything like that. So it's good to be able to take your time and do these things and not have to rush through. 
Yeah, absolutely. You're not like, hey, uh, I need you to have an album out because I need you to go on tour for four months or anything like that, you know? So Yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, all right, so let's uh, go, like, way back. Uh, you grew up uh, – did you grow up in Tampa? Yep, I was born here and uh, been here my whole life. What – uh? So when, when did music first come across your radar? Like as a kid, was there like music being played at your house all the time growing up? Or uh, do you recall like your first memory of like hearing music? Yeah, I actually had kind of a cool background of that. Like, well, well, I remember when I was really young, like my mom had that first Black Sabbath record. And I remember I used to, I was like, you know, like four or five years old. And I'm like looking at this record cover, you know, with the green lady in the front. And I'm like, whoa this is weird you know and you know she used to play that you know iron butterfly and black yeah. sap and stuff like that and she wasn't like always into the heavy stuff but she she had a few albums that were heavier like that and i used to uh, was like wow this stuff's pretty crazy and i always <laughs> liked uh, monsters you know when yeah. i was growing up so uh, that album cover was one of those things that just really stuck with me for some reason that first black sabbath and oh, yeah. uh and, you know, I started then I started getting into like, you know, Zeppelin and stuff like that, because I grew up in the 70s and, and you know, you didn't have Zeppelin was considered heavy metal. They were called yeah. they were probably them and Sabbath were, were probably the first couple of bands that were ever, you know, coined heavy metal. Yeah. And even though I wouldn't really call much of Zeppelin heavy metal, I, I, I love the band, but, you know, you can't really say that they're a heavy metal band, you know, by any means. Yeah, I agree. So, but then, um, my mom actually had a band. Oh, wow. In, in the mid, yeah. When I was uh, about 10 years old, she had a band and they used to practice at the house and she used to sing and, and they used to play, you know, like some local bars and things like that. And they did, you know, like, uh, Creedence Clearwater revival and, uh, uh, think of uh janice joplin stuff like that um so i used to sit there and watch them practice and i always would sit by the drummer you know and i always thought yeah. well the bass player was like your 70s bass player you just kind of sat in the back boom boo -doom, boo -doom, you know that kind of thing and and uh you know the guitar player he was into the creedence clearwater revival stuff so he wasn't you know like a black sabbath tony iomi kind of guitar player yeah, And so I always kind of liked the drummer, you know, I was like, I always sat by then and listened to him and, and they lasted a couple of years. It was called Foxy with like two X's and a uh, F O X X Y. Yeah. And, and that's awesome. Yeah. You know, like I said, they just, they never really played out of town or anything, but you know, it was kind of cool. So I was around the music thing and then, you know, uh, I think it was seventh grade, uh, where you started doing like school band stuff a little more seriously and, then eighth and ninth grade was middle school for us. And that's where I actually picked an instrument. And I was like, oh, I want to play drums. <laughs> Are you so, in the school band? Yeah, I was in school band for eighth and ninth. And then I went into high school because uh, when I was in school, uh, 10th, 11th and 12th was high school. Oh, okay. So I went into 10th grade high school and I was uh, in the school band. But for 11th and 12th, I wasn't in the school band because – they practice like two hours a day after school, like five days a week. Cause it was the marching band. And yeah. um, I, I had to have a job. My mom wasn't, you know, I was uh, a single kid, you know, with, with a single mom and we didn't have a lot of money back then. So if I wanted a car, you know, and you know, insurance and all that stuff, if I wanted to drive, I had to work. So I've been working, you know, jobs ever since I've been like 15 and, and it's just a guy kind of grow up, grew up, with that kind of mental attitude situation where you got to work to get things, you know, cause uh, I was never handed it too much cause we just didn't have a lot of money. So I had to quit the school band because I couldn't practice, you know, marching practice for two hours every day after school. I had to go to work yeah. and, and um, well, I didn't have to, but I couldn't have got anywhere because I wouldn't have had a car. I'd have still been riding a bicycle at 17 years old. So <laughs> You know, I decided to go the work route instead. And yeah. um, the worst thing was that there was a jazz band, of course, that the high school had. And our our drum teacher or well, I should say our music teacher wouldn't let me be in the jazz band if I he said, nope, you have to be in the marching band to be in the jazz band. 
Hmm. So I kind of, I only had like 10th grade of drumming, you know, and, and uh, that was about it. After that, I bought my own, you know, bought a little drum set and, and uh, I think my mom bought the first one, but I think I bought the second one. What kind uh, was it? Do you remember? Yeah. The first one I had was like a little three piece gold sparkle Gretsch kit. Okay. And then um, the second one, it was red and I'm trying to remember it was a red sparkle kit. And I think it was I'm trying to remember what brand it was. Uh, it wasn't a Ludwig. I think Ludwig. It was a, yeah, I was thinking Ludwig, but maybe not. No, I think it was a Slingerland maybe. Um, but the second kit I kind of bought and pieced together and had, and it's funny cause I had like the six, eight, then I bought a Vista light kit cause of, oh. cause of, Bonham, you know, yeah, cause I, yeah. was still, I still loved uh, Led Zeppelin and I used to have, and there was a record store down the street from me and I used to ride my bicycle to the record store and I would get these albums that, that the guy that owned the record store, uh, it was called asylum records. And the guy, I still remember his name. His name was Fred. And every time I go in there, he'd be playing heavy metal, new heavy metal stuff from, from Europe, you know, yeah. like the new age of British heavy metal stuff when it was coming out the first couple iron maidens and, then he showed me this record, uh, Angel Witch. Oh, and I, was just, I saw that cover and I was like, wow, this is pretty crazy. So I bought that record and <laughs> came, came home and listened to it. And I, that was it. I was like, wow. And then, you know, Merciful Fate put out that first EP with the girl oh, on the cross. Yeah. Oh, and I, I saw that and I was like, oh, my God. You know, I started listening to this stuff and I, I was hooked big time, you know, with that. So that's uh, I used to have a a record player behind my drum set and these two huge speakers. And I yeah. used to literally, you know, drop the needle down on the thing and turn around and start playing to these. Play out. And uh, so that, that's, you know, how that kind of came about. I kind of, with the drum set itself, I taught myself. Yeah. Um, Cause I didn't really have a lot of schooling in school, just for eighth, ninth and 10th grade. And, um, you know, that it was kind of elementary stuff. Like I did some timpani playing and, Star Wars themes, stuff like that. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that, so I guess when you first started, you were just uh, playing along to, to, like you said, albums and kind of, uh, I guess, getting your chops down or whatever before you actually, you know, were in a band. Yep, yep, definitely. I did that for a couple of years. Actually, I just didn't really know a lot of people that were uh, musicians in my neighborhood, yeah. and uh, especially guitar players and stuff like that. It, until I started meeting people finally, you know, in, in my last year of high school, I met Trey. He had, he had moved. Uh, I, for, I don't know where he was living before that, but he had just moved to, to the area that I live in and he was new in the school and he was a, he's a year younger than me. So he was like uh, in, in uh, 11th grade when I was in 12th grade and I met him and we started talking and we both liked angel, Witch, we both liked this, that a lot of, you know, Priest Scorpions, things like that back then. Yeah. And, uh, and he played guitar. He had just got his first guitar for Christmas. And we're like, you know, we started jamming at my mom's house where her band used to practice in the same room, you know, so it was kind of cool. And so she was up, you know, okay with that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we put a little band together and we did a, our high school talent show. Oh, in 19, wow. Yeah. In 1982. And the band was called, we, Actually, Trey came up with the name with that one too, Ice. It was called I I C E Ice, and uh, so. What did you play? What did you play at the talent show? It was really uh, mainly covers like Scorpions and Judas Priest uh, oh, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. That. Yeah, do you uh, remember what? Do you remember the tracks? Oh shoot, I can't. It's. I think we only played about five songs, but uh, okay. probably something like Living After Midnight and uh, the Zoo. Oh yeah, you know things like that. It was. Um, you know, awesome. older scorpions and priest stuff. Of course, you're talking 1980, 82. Yeah. So a lot of stuff. Went <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that had just came out as a matter of yeah, fact, I think I so. that, that came out right around 81, 82. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, it was kind of the cool first start to things. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. Oh, oh actually. So, uh, I was going to ask you, uh, you brought up like Merciful Fate album and the Angel Witch. 
did uh did your mom like uh what what was her thoughts on on did you, she ever see your album covers or anything like that back then like what yeah, the hell is this no like i said she had the black sabbath cover you know, she had the oh, first. That's right, that's right. So, yeah, that's right. It, it never, she never really said anything like that. And, and, and in fact, you know, back then, she even kind of dabbled in a little bit of witchcraft type stuff, and you know, oh, okay. like, not not seriously, seriously, but you know, she was open to it. So you know, I mean, when I was, um, you know, fifteen, sixteen, we we you know, and and met Trey. We, we were you know, robbing the 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 tombstones off graves, you know, like the oh. cross. <laughs> I, had, yeah. I had an altar with an upside down cross in my room. Oh, and, and my mom never said anything about that stuff. I, I know Trey's mom didn't like it at first. Uh, and she, she was quite upset about that kind of stuff. She was kind of religious. For a while. <laughs> it seems like he's been, she's gotten a lot different. Um, she's a lot more, she loves what Trey does now. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, uh, you guys were doing that in 82 though. Hell yeah. You know, but yeah, uh, it was kind of cool. I had this big upside down cross altar in my my bedroom, and uh, nobody else had that kind of stuff back then. Oh, of course know? not. It was pretty yeah, cool. I, don't, I mean, especially at that time. Yeah. Now, now it's like, hey, uh, you know, little Timmy's got an upside down cross in his room now. You know, it's like no big deal now. But well, know. he uh, Trey played Dungeons and Dragons, and I never really played that back then. Uh, cause I didn't, I didn't really ever hang out with a lot of people in my neighborhood. There wasn't a lot of kids or anything. Yeah. So I always, always kind of stuck to myself and just, you know, watch movies and stuff like that uh, yeah. on TV and, and listen to records, you know, that kind of stuff. I was more, uh, into music than anything, just listening to it you yeah. know, by myself, just hanging out and, um, meeting him was kind of cool because he was, uh, he, he was like, do you ever hear, hear this book called the Necronomicon? I'm like, I've got that, you know, and, and I'm like, <laughs> you got the satanic Bible. And he's like, yeah, I got that too. You know? So yeah. that was kind of cool. We both had the same books and, and my, like now my book, occult book collection is about around 500 books now. Oh, wow. I still have some of the books that I had even back then. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I try to, I've got a lot of things that I, you know, I had back then that I still have. Uh, luckily, I've been able to hang on to things for several years. Oh yeah, somebody Some, asked if you still have things over the years, but I've hung on to uh, a pretty good little amount of stuff. Uh, somebody asked if you still have the cross. <laughs> no, I don't have the cross, but you know what I do have is uh, uh, these. Uh, you'll see them in, in when we did the Rocky Point Beach Resort show uh, in Morbid yeah, Angel. Well, in yeah, well, I was going to bring that up, but yeah, you'll see two statues on the stage with. They're, they're like little, they're about a foot high and yeah. they're square. Like they have four sides to them, like a pottery kind of thing where you could put pottery in it or something. Uh -huh. On each side, there's a face, like a demon face. Yeah. And, and I had those back then and I still have those. Sick. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember we, we, uh, me and Trey and Dallas and another friend of ours, uh, Scott, I believe, was the other person but since there was four faces on each we each took a face and painted it our own way yeah and you can see them on the uh you can see them on, on that video they're on stage yeah and i believe that there was a big cross on stage too one, uh, i don't know if it was that one that i had but uh yeah i still have those statues though they've they've stayed with me you know the whole time they're not painted the same i painted them uh gray to match my yeah. house i had them out on in front of my house on these little small things for That's yeah, fucking That's fucking little, awesome. I cemented them down. And when I, when I sold that house and moved to the one I'm in now, I actually broke them off to cement and brought them over here. Yeah, so. That's all. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted, uh, I wanted to talk to you about a band that I know you guys and like a lot of the Tampa bands and Florida bands. Every time I would read like interviews of like, this is a band and uh, at least one of them, there was always two bands, but, uh, this is the this is the band I'm talking about right here. Oh, yeah, Nasty of course. Savage. I mean, what what uh, what was it about Nasty Savage? I mean, I know. I mean, I know now. A lot of people know now, but uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about? I mean, the influence these guys had on like pretty much everybody back then. Oh yeah, that. Well, the the weird thing is like we were a Tampa band, 
And um, the band that influenced me in Tampa was called Argus. Oh, okay. uh, and they were actually a bar band, but they were even older than 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 us. And they were playing bars when I first was able to when I first was able to go into a bar. The drinking age was like 19. And, <laughs> and so right out of high school, I started seeing this band called Argus and they were doing Angel Witch covers and, oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, they were doing they did a Black Sabbath tribute and Angel Witch covers and songs like storm child things like that they they did a lot of scorpions and priest and 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 their singer had a really killer voice and, and i used to go watch them play all the time yeah. so when argus argus was the band that i i really uh, kind of like wanted to style my stuff after their drummer had a really huge drum set and mm -hmm. i didn't know nasty savage back then when i was watching argus oh, okay. so because their uh, nasty savage was a brandon band and we were Tampa. So even though they're now they're it's not far apart, Brandon seemed like it was another part of the world back when you're like 18 years old. So, yeah, yeah. and I know they were around and I'd heard of them, but I remember I, I was already in Morbid Angel and uh, we went out to Brandon one night because we were hearing about these big old parties and, uh, Nasty Savage was playing. They had this big trailer out in this field, uh, yeah. like a flatbed trailer that they were playing on. And <laughs> we went out there because we were hearing about these huge metal parties that were going on out there. And it's like, wow, this is cool. So we went out there and, you know, saw, saw them play. And it was just like, wow, these guys are really awesome. And also, I have to say, Sabotage, of course. Um, yeah, that was the other one I was talking about. Right. And, and I saw them when they were Avatar. Right. I believe when I was 16, uh, I saw Avatar. They were playing in a parking lot, a show in a parking lot of a skating rink, I believe it was, or a bowling alley, something like that. I think it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was a skating rink or a bowling alley, but it, it was uh, in, in Clearwater, Florida, and because they weren't from Tampa either. So I, I remember going to see them back in like that would have been like 1980 wow yeah so I, I i knew them and they used to then they became sabotage and i even have like the first album sirens signed by all the original members and, wow. it, and it actually says to morbid mike so <laughs> i was in there when they signed that yeah it was on the par records uh the original one so yeah. i i that i still have that with uh signed to morbid mike which is kind of funny so yeah, that's it, awesome. it was uh yeah and then like you know we started then um argus not argus but um sabotage started playing this pub in brandon called the brandon pub and now uh oh bro uh -oh. you froze up we lost mike we lost Mike. He's frozen. He's frozen. Let's see what happens. Let's see if he comes back. <laughs> uh, hold on. Here we go. Are you there? Yeah. Let me let me remove your old one. You can see yourself on screen. There we go. All right. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I was talking and just everything just yeah, went it hurt. froze. Yeah, it froze. It froze. No, but anyway, the so the Brandon Pub uh, had you know, sabotage and nasty savage playing there. And it was really awesome. And I used to go there a lot. That's when I started driving more. And, you know, I was like, I think I was 18 or 19 at 19 at the time, yeah. right about then. And, uh, and it was like, a that was pretty much it. You know, they nasty savage was starting to get really big and sabotage was already really big. And, yeah. you know, I was in morbid angel and, we started playing. There was another place called Ruby's pub that they played at. And I don't think we never played there with Morbid Angel. We used to go there all the time and see uh, nasty Savage played there a lot in the beginning. So, but that first time I saw him, that was before even Curtis joined the band. And I think they only had, they had a different guitar player too, I believe. Hmm. I don't think uh, Dave was in the band yet, even at that point. Wow. So it was like three of the original members that were on the first album, but not all five of them. So, right. but I think that was only, uh, I think it was Craig Huffman that was a drummer back then. And then they, they uh, did that little bit of change and added Dave and added Curtis. And 
then they recorded that first album. So, but they were, they were definitely the first, like, um, I guess you could say heavier band than, than Sabotage and Argus. Uh, yeah. That that they were definitely like the first one in Tampa to come out, or the Tampa area, I should say, because they're branded. But they they were doing some crazy stuff back then, and of course they still do now. And we've gotten along really good with them. Uh, with Nocturnus AD, we went to Chile uh, yeah. a couple of years ago and did a show with them there. And we went to LA and did a uh, the strike LA Strike Fest festival with with Nasty Savage too. We all flew out there in the plane together and. We had a great time. We get along really good with those guys. So it's it's been like uh it's kind of good hooking back up with them again cuz even though Nocturnus AD is a newer band, I've still been around for a long time and it's kind of like, you know, when we play and they play yeah. together, it really makes and the music's completely different from what we yeah. both do, but it just really makes a good show, you know, us and Nasty Savage playing together. It's been it's been really cool. Uh, the, yeah. the the thing we did in Chile was awesome. We were there for four or five days and we all hung out, you know, and had a great time. So we all get along really well. And uh, it's been fun kind of hooking back up with those guys. Yeah. Nasty Ronnie's still nasty Ronnie. So I'm sure it's pretty oh, yeah. well. He's always <laughs> been nasty Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, let's get into uh, uh we touched on it briefly already. Uh, get Morbid Angel uh, going. When you guys first started, uh, you and Trey, I mean, was your did you set out like we're, we're going to try to make the most evil shit we can think of? Like the most, I mean, what what was the mindset uh, when you first were beginning the band? Well, like I said, at first, you know, it was just a high school project, and we we it was it was Trey and I, and uh, we had a singer um, and, named Howard, and I remember the the bass player i think was named dave i think and we had another guitar player too mike and and i don't know whatever happened to those guys um <laughs> the dave and mike i i i used to see howard quite often still um he, i think he's living up in maine or somewhere like that now but uh you know first we were just doing some 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 cover tunes of course and i think everybody kind of starts out that way uh, but right away, Trey's like, I want to play our own stuff. And I'm like, okay, you know, no problem there. So sometimes we used to get together and, and uh, well, right after high school, he moved to the, to like the North end of Tampa, which was like I said, back when you're a kid, it seemed like it was a long ways away. Yeah. And we kind of didn't talk to each other for maybe seven or eight months. And then we hooked back up again and he had uh, hooked up with Dallas and had, they had a drummer from Lakeland that was kind of older than them. And he just wasn't kind of getting what they were doing. And they had a singer named Charles and they were called death watch. Hmm. So Trey's like, yeah, the, the drummer we have is older than us and he's not understanding what we're wanting to do here. And they were, went, they were only doing originals at that point. And he's like, do you want to, you know, hook up back up again and start playing? I'm like, sure. Yeah. So I, I brought my drums out there and uh, we started doing death watch and then the singer got into some trouble. He was doing dealing some drugs. And he got into some big trouble and went uh -huh. to jail for like 10 years. So and that just left me and Trey in Dallas. And at that point, you know, we, we kind of changed the name from Death Watch to Heretic. And then we found out there was a Heretic out in California already. And yeah. that's when Trey came up. Uh, this guy named Johnny, he said our band sounded really morbid because – Morbid Tales was out yeah. at that point. And uh, Trey came up with Morbid Angel. And once we became Morbid Angel, it just kind of like, it was weird. Once that name kind of came into play and it just kind of all snapped together and we uh, didn't even have vocals for a while. It was just the three of us jamming. And uh, we did, uh, I remember we played out in a parking lot once too uh, at a bar called Mark Twain's. And this was like 1980 and uh, no, not, 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 not 80, 83. Sorry. This was 1983. And uh, we had, it was just the three of us, no vocals. And we used Argus's PA <laughs> and uh, they had like a car smash for cancer or something like that. And they had a car out in the parking lot. People were hitting it with a sledgehammer 
you yeah. know, for a dollar a piece and, and we were playing and it was pretty crazy. And then, <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a, a really neat little beach out there. And, you know, back then a lot of people partied and had, you know, hot rod cars and stuff like that. And we used to rent a generator and go to like the causeway beach and just set up. I mean, pretty much just set up in the sand and with a generator and start jamming. And we'd get these big crowds of people watching us and we didn't have vocals or anything. We, we there was a park we used to go to that had this really small little hill and it had a <laughs> gazebo on the top, but it had electricity up there Yeah, and, and it had like a stone gazebo up there. And we used to go up, walk our equipment up all these steps of this mountain <laughs> a little mountain hill not mountain but hill uh and, you know it's probably about maybe 40 feet high or so and we'd go up there and set up and start playing and things like that was, you know we just start doing that kind of stuff and we were doing parties and oh, yeah. uh, then we started trying out some singers and we went through two or three singers uh trying them out and right back then we were looking for a king diamond type of vocalist because merciful fate was really big yeah, there's an mm -hmm. early rehearsal with uh, I can't I don't know who the vocalist was where he's going ah, or whatever yeah. I can't I don't know who that that, I can't remember who that was. Yeah, it was a guy named Kenny. We tried out. Oh, Kenny um, Yeah, he was quite older than us too, and he had a big PA and light system, and he's like, I can sing falsetto <laughs> like King Diamond. So yeah, we, yeah. We kind of jammed with him a few times, and he's like, Oh, my friend's got a studio. You know, let's go in there. So we went in there and recorded a couple songs, and yeah. Dallas uh, actually sang the backup vocals on that and he also sang the vocals to show kenny how to do it you know where they go yeah and, and uh like after we recorded we realized well this isn't working this high voice with this music we need somebody that sings lower in a lower register and yeah since dallas did the backups and he did a version with the vocals we were like damn this actually sounds pretty good right here he had a kind of a chronos kind of voice so Dallas became the vocalist. Yeah. And uh, then we kind of realized that most of the bands we listened to had two guitar players and Trey loved to play leads all night long. And we liked that, but it was really empty. <laughs> so um, I had met Richard Burnell at a party and, and, you know, I was telling Richard, you know, he knew who we were more, but we were already more of an angel at the time. And, you know, I said, you know, we are looking for a second guitar player. Uh, mostly to play rhythms and stuff like that. And, you know, and uh, he's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. So Richard joined the band and uh, we did a couple shows with where Richard tried to sing too. And, and uh, but the problem with Richard was having a problem every time he'd sing, he couldn't play guitar at the same time. So he would have to stop playing guitar and sing. And we did a couple shows that way um, with both of them kind of sharing the vocals Oh, wow. And then Dallas got into a bunch of trouble w with the law and got arrested and put in jail. So that left us looking for another bass player. And, and that's when we got Johnny Ortega. Yeah. And right after that, uh, a friend of mine that was actually from Brandon, that was a singer. Uh, his name was metal Mike. Uh, he had moved to, to North Carolina. And one day he called me and said, Mike, I'm I'm in this band with this guy named David Vincent and you know, and he, he's a bass player and I'm, I'm singing, but he's got a, a financial backer and he's got a label. And I told him about you guys and, uh, you know, and, and all the stuff you guys were doing and this and that. And uh, he wants to sign you guys and he's got, you know, quite a bit of money behind him. And yeah. I was like, you know, we, we were just still local at that point. We had never played anywhere else, but you know, Tampa and parties and a couple little bars and stuff like that. And so David sent us a, con a recording contract and we we're like, okay, you know, we just signed it right away. And we went up there to North Carolina and recorded the abominations record. Yeah. And uh, that's basically how that happened. <laughs> Damn. I have a, hold on, let me see if I can find it. I have a, is it the flyer? Yeah. I had this, I've had this forever. And this this is actually the uh, the flyer from his label saying first LP or whatever that's going to come out, the Abominations of Desolation on uh, Gort. So uh, I've had that, I don't know for how long, but I scanned it recently for something else. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, let me uh, let me 
I figured I'd show you that. I don't know when, when the last time you saw that flyer, but yeah, I've seen this before. Um, yeah, it was Gorick Records, and as you see, it says producer David Vincent. Yeah, and uh, you know, engineer uh, Bill Matoyer, and that is Bill the Bill Matoyer. Matoyer. Yeah, for you know, he he was on for Slayer. Yeah, he, he, he famous. Yeah, yeah, he's done so many bands. He even did worked on that first Metallica record, I believe. Not all of it, but he did some stuff on that. Um, he he's done. Lizzie Borden. I mean, most of the uh, back in the early days, he did most most of the bands for uh, Metal Blade. And yeah, uh, yeah, he did. I, I still talk to Bill. We've we've stayed friends all these years from from just meeting him that one time back then, um, and working with him. So well, we still talk all you know on, on Facebook quite often. I'll say, "Hey, Bill, what's up?" And he's like, "Hey, Mike," you know. So um, he's a really good guy. Yeah, he's. Uh, I mean, Bill Matoyer. If you if you've been in metal for a while you should know who that is. I mean, he produced all yeah. kinds of, you know, uh, yeah. Metal Blade, especially for Metal Blade, right? Well, you know, the thing was, uh, we recorded in North Carolina, and it was actually a country music studio. <laughs> so the, the two guys that were in the studio that owned the studio, I believe they owned the studio or they worked there, the two engineers that were from that studio had no clue even what metal was at all, especially back then in, you know, 1986. Yeah, of course. So David was like, you know, like I said, he had a lot of backing money behind him. And yeah. uh, he uh, he he said, well, I'm going to get Bill Matoyer to engineer the record. Yeah. So we were like, OK, you know, <laughs> that sounds good to us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was our first experience with anything like in a real real studio, you know, like we had been in some small little studios back then uh, in Tampa, but nothing like more sound or anything even for us what, back then. What did the engineers think of you, uh, of the stuff you were playing at the time? Were they freaking out or had they heard I mean, it before? I mean, they were just kind of standing around like, wow, this is kind of strange, but I, it's <laughs> kind of, they weren't really around that much. They kind of yeah. left, uh, left everything. Once they realized that the bill was like who he was, you know, they were just like, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. here, here, you know here's the controls. And David, wasn't really doing any of the controls or anything. He just was, I don't know what he really did, but he, he was the money guy basically. So. Yeah. Uh, here's, he a, pretty... here's an older picture. I don't know if, uh, I found this online, but uh, who's in this? Uh, well, if you're looking at it, uh, uh, the guy on the bottom is Dallas, the bass player. Okay. Trey's on, on the right and I'm on the yeah. left. And the guy in yeah. the middle uh, was a guy named Mark. And uh -huh. he was another one of those people like I, well, this is when we were um, um, heretic. Oh, OK. Wow. Yeah. And we were trying out singers even back then. And uh, the guy in the middle, he's he was a singer that tried out for us named Mark. And he had a he had that kind of Queens right kind of voice. So we <laughs> we tr we tried a lot of different people out just to yeah. see what we fit. We didn't really know what we wanted back then because, you know, there weren't, wasn't really a lot of metal out. Yeah, and, yeah, of course. You know, people like Dio were big. Yeah, and yeah. That was the kind of, that was metal back then, you know, and Slayer was just starting to come out. And, uh, you know, hearing that first Slayer record, it was like, wow, this is kind of cool. But even, it, you know, the first couple Slayer records, he was doing quite a few highs. Yeah, the, yeah, he was, he was. The, the scream, so, you know... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and like I said, once we heard Merciful Fate, it was over. Yeah, was, yeah. Oh my god, this band is is godly, you know. And King yeah. Diamond still nobody sings like him. No, no. You know, I mean, I've heard people sing sort of similar, but I mean, he still has that totally original voice. Yeah, and Merciful Fate, nobody will ever be able to like uh recreate that just those guys that did it back then, you know. Oh, I know. Uh, and German, they were just an amazing guitar team, and oh yeah, and, oh, you know, I, it was it was such a those. I mean, Melissa was just a, a masterpiece to me, and then then it went into "Don't Break the Oath," and it just was like, wow, listen to these songs, you know. It's like, wow. We're, Did we're you get gonna... to see him on that "Don't Break the Oath" tour in '84? Um, they no. play down that way. Oh, okay. No, you know the thing was bad. They never, they didn't come to Tampa till much later. Oh, okay, yeah, kind probably of that reunion together uh, when they got back together again. Yeah, ninety three. Yeah, 
Yeah. I um, I did see him then. Yeah, me and, too. But before that, I never really got the opportunity to because a lot of bands back then missed Florida uh, and didn't come down there. Yeah. And just because of the way Florida is, it's it's, it's a long state and you kind of like you got to get down to Miami to play, but then you got to go all the way back up eight hours yeah. to get back out of Florida. So a lot of these bands um, didn't come to Florida back then. I mean, if you look up North and you see all these shows happening, you know, uh, in New York and places yeah. like that back in the eighties. And the, you didn't get half of these bands that would come all the way down to. Yeah. It was just, yeah, it's a logistical nightmare. It's the same thing here in, like, in Houston area. I mean, you know, it's, we're kind of out of the way, but, you know, it's gotten, it's gotten okay. Uh, here's one of the coolest fit photos I've ever seen of you. This one right here. How, how, how long ago was that? <laughs> that was, uh, I want to say, 1984 or, or 1985. And what that wow. is, uh, that backdrop behind me, Yes. It's a Black Sabbath. Oh, Black. yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Uh, it's, I just realized, yeah, it's, uh, it's the, uh, yeah, I know exactly what that is. And uh, Trey actually did the the uh, Morbid Angel over it in red. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't right. know if you've to that, but um, yeah, it was it used to be able to buy these flags, all you know, like in the yeah, records yeah. and, and uh, banners, flags, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and Trey had bought that one. And I, and uh, he took red paint and painted more of an angel over the Black Sabbath. So that's funny. It, kinda, it was cool. Yeah, it was funny. It, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. But I think that that was actually a party that we played. Oh wow! Yep. I yeah, think that, that was, yeah. I can't believe I didn't put that. Yeah, that's that, that that's that famous Black Sabbath six 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 goal. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah, it is. Yep, it sure is. And yep. it said Black Sabbath right there. Where? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the color of the flag threw me off. I don't know. But, yeah, I mean, who doesn't know? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's exactly That's, what that is. Yep. yep. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, somebody uh, asked, I guess, while we're on, a uh, friend had a blue CD that had the Morbid Angel logo on it. It had a high-pitched singer. Do you know what that was? I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. What we were talking about earlier, the guy Kenny. Yeah, with Kenny. Kenny Bamber, right? Is that his name? Right, exactly, yeah. He, yeah. Um, he he had a huge PA and a huge light system, and uh, and he was the one that told us I can sing just like King Diamond. I got that falsetto down. Yeah, and uh, we like I said, it, he didn't sound too bad when we were playing live, you know, like practicing live. I should say, you know, yeah. with the, with a lot of delay and and echo and stuff on there, reverb. It sounded okay, but then when we went in the studio, it just like it just when you hear it back like that. It's one thing when you're playing. You know, you kind of get caught in up and everything. But then when you record and you go back and listen to it, then you really go, Ooh, this doesn't fit. And I think that was uh, the deciding factor where we kind of gave up trying to find that King Diamond type of vocalist for our band. Yeah. And, and that's where we went to the uh, more lower style singing. Yeah. So you you started singing when, like, 85 with the yeah. band? Yeah. So what uh, what I mean your vocals at that time i mean other than like at that range i guess like bathory maybe i mean what 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 made you i guess what influenced that vocal style that far that long ago at that time well i was definitely bathory was one of the ones that you know that that i i, I used to listen to a lot and yeah. um but the weird thing about it was i never really tried it just was like that's the way it came out of my mouth you know uh, we had Dallas was singing and it was actually going pretty good. And then we had Richard doing some vocals too. But like I said, he, he, every time he tried to sing, he had to stop playing guitar. He just couldn't get the, that part down. I mean, eventually he probably would have got it, but his vocals were kind of, you can hear that. And there's like a recording called the power company uh -huh. uh, from the power company. It's like a 1985 or early 85 or late 84 recording. We played there a couple of times, so I'm not sure which recording, um, was the one where where they were both singing on it, but you can hear the difference between Dallas and yeah. and Richard singing the different songs. And when Dallas went to jail, that just left Richard singing, and, and he couldn't sing and play. You know, there was a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, that that he uh, 
couldn't do at the time. So I was just like, I knew the words. I knew what the band needed. And, and I used to listen to Exciter a lot. Yeah. And, and their drummer sings. Yeah. Dan Beeler. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, this guy can sing like that. Cause he had those killer highs too. Yeah. And of course I never really tried to do anything like what he did. Cause, uh, but I was like, if this guy can sing like he does and play drums, I should be able to do that too. So, <laughs> you know, it was a good, cause I already knew the, the words I, you know, it, it, I, I already had a memorized from hearing everybody else singing, Yeah, you know, when we play shows and practice all the time. And yeah. uh, so I was just like, I'm going to give it a try. And, you know, Trey was up for it. He's like, yeah, let's try it. You know? And even Richard was fine with it. And, we had just got that the new bass player, Johnny Ortega. And uh, we did a party in Winter Haven, Lakeland area, uh, where Johnny was from. And it was, the house had like 200 people in it. Oh, wow. And it was the first time I had sang live. And it actually just went really well. <laughs> and everybody was flipping out. And, wow, we've never seen anything like this before. You know, it was crazy. And, and uh things kind of just like took off right from there. Once we got uh, Johnny in there and, and, and I started singing, Yeah, uh, started doing a few more shows around Tampa and, and uh, we did uh, one in Brandon at a yeah. teen kind of place. Uh, was it called teens? I think it was called. And, and uh, like nasty savage used to play there a lot. So it already had a great crowd coming there. And, and we, um, we played there with massacre and, and it was like we had played a uh, we had played that power company with Massacre too, and and that's when Richard and uh, Dallas were singing. But uh, we played that teens place with Massacre, and it was the first time I had sang really in a big in a, in a decent sized club, and it, it went over really well. Johnny had a friend, and they were we we had the fire you know, a couple little fire pods and things like that. Oh, yeah. So we were putting a little show together with it along with it. Yeah. And it just like blew up pretty, pretty good from that show. And then <laughs> we ended up going and recording the record right away. And like in April, yeah. right after that show, we went and recorded and then we came back and then we did that, that, uh, that, that, uh, Rocky horror, Rocky, Rocky point. Yeah, no, I, yeah I, 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 I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I was, that was, that's exactly where I was going next. But my, I guess, uh, uh, my buddy Sam has asked a couple of times about the lyrics on, on that abominations of desolation. Did you guys share lyric or share lyric writing or who, who wrote the words on those, on that uh, back then? Well, Trey wrote most of it, but, um, I definitely like Chapel of Ghouls. I wrote a lot of that song. Yeah. Uh, and, and, um, Hell Spawn, I wrote all of that. Um, Demon Seed, I wrote all of that. And then um, once I started singing, the lyrics kind of changed a little bit. Uh, yeah. And and I was putting my own stuff into them. And stuff like Angel of G Disease and Welcome to Hell, um, yeah. things like that. Trey had wrote most of the lyrics to those, but I kind of changed some things around so I could sing them yeah. and um, added some different lyrics here and there. And so, we, I mean, most of it was Trey, but there was, you know, well, Hellspawn and and, uh, and Demon Sea were all um, my lyrics. And then uh, Chapel of Ghouls was about probably half and half, I'd say, maybe, Trey and me. Oh, yeah. And then some of the other songs, I just had little parts in here and there where I'd fix stuff and change stuff. Yeah. Yeah, those, I mean, classic. I, I mean, those lyrics are like, you know, they stay in your head. Uh, all right, so we've, it's been brought up a couple times already, but this is a very infamous show. Uh, the Rocky Point show, this is just one of the flyers of, from that show. I know I've seen several, but uh, this, uh, I mean, to me, it's, I mean, I, I think I have like all the soundboards from, from, I think, from all the bands, but this is one of the most infamous like underground shows like of all time. Uh, one because of the bands, and two because of the the location where it was at. It looked like it was some kind of it was at a resort, right? Like a hotel resort or something. Yep. Yeah. And sure. uh, yeah, and who 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 put that show together? Who booked it? Um, the there was a. What's funny is is 
that was a hotel that was kind of um, situated right on the beach. Uh, and again, in that causeway beach that I was talking about before that sometimes we used to just go up, go out there to part of it where more of the sand was, this was yeah. on the beginning part of the beach where the hotel was. Uh -huh. And they had actually, they had a bar there. And I remember there was a guy named Dave Edwards and he used to run the bar there and he used to book all the bands that would come into the bar. And, and what happened was they had sold the hotel and they were going to tear it down and build a new hotel. So they wanted to have one big, like huge bash before yeah. that happened. And, and we were starting to get really popular at the time. So, you know, Dave Edwards came up to us and said, why don't we do this huge metal show and get bands from all over Florida, you know, cause Hellwitch was from down Miami area, Fort, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. And, you know, Ravage was actually atheist. Um, yeah, Ravage, yeah. You know, and, and um, like Executioner, of course, was obituary, became yeah. obituary. And actually, uh, Executioner even played in the small bar that was there at the end of the hotel. There was a, like an inside bar, too. Oh, wow. Dave Edwards had this idea of bringing in this huge stage outside and a big PA, and it was right on the water. And it was really cool. And we actually played two nights there the 25th yeah. and 26th. And um, it, it was uh, what was really cool about it was, was it was the last weekend that the bar, that the uh, hotel was actually open. Oh, and they, wow. were, they were demoing the whole, whole building. I mean, it was coming down completely. They were leveling it and they were going to build a whole new hotel ground up. Yeah. And it's still, there's a new, there's a hotel there now. And I believe it's like a Hilton or something, a really nice one. And uh, so Dave was like, you guys can do anything you want to this hotel. <laughs> People were throwing the TVs out the second story windows, balconies. Uh, we're taking chairs and putting them into the wall and sitting on them up on the wall, like putting all four legs. And, you know, like people were going down the hallway and just ripping the paper off the walls. The and putting kicking holes in the you know they didn't care they were actually like you yeah. know hey, whatever destruction you do to this hotel is only going to help them tear this place down yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like, whatever and the whole hotel was sold out if you look there's a lot of people there and, yeah and they sold out the whole whole hotel for the whole weekend and we had a couple rooms ourselves and we just destroyed that place it was it was fantastic <laughs> the stuff like that just never happens, you know? Yeah, there's a, I think uh, on one of the videos, I think at the beginning, I don't know if it's before Hellwitch, uh, but you see Pat from Hellwitch and somebody else like on on, on top, uh, I guess in a room somewhere, like calling everybody posers or something like that. But <laughs> <this is>. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's, there's two recordings of that. I don't know. Uh, on my face, on my YouTube channel, yeah. I have recordings I've got the the one you see that's close up, but there's also yeah. one from from the soundboard that that actually Mike Borders from Massacre had for yeah. all these years, and it got kind of like he found it after several years, and wow. he gave it to me, so I put it up. So there's actually a, another version of that show that a lot of people don't even know exists, and it's from farther back, and you can see the whole thing going on, which is oh, kind of. Okay. And the funny thing is, is um, that was right after we recorded the record, right? And, and David Vincent and that guy, Metal Mike, the singer, and I think Wayne Hartzell, who became the drummer after drummer, me. Yeah, yeah. They're all at that show. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you can see him walking around. Yeah. So if you look on that video, you'll see David Vincent walking around watching us play. Yeah. And the other guy, there's two other guys with him, and that's two of the guys. That was Wayne and uh, Mike. They came, all came down here from North Carolina to see the show. Of course, we were signed to his label at the time. Right. So, But he still had – I think his band that he had with all those guys was called Baron Cemetery. I'm not sure how you spell it. or Sounds about but, right. Yeah, I think that was what it was called. Um, but they had a band, like I said, and, and uh, they had a guitar player, Steve – Skeletor from Hallow's Eve. Oh, okay. He wasn't at that show there, but he was their guitar player and he had just quit. So what I found out was David Vincent was looking for a guitar player at the time when he signed us. Oh. 
And when he saw Trey, he was like, oh, this guy's going to be my guitar player no matter <laughs> what. So, um, yeah, it ended up happening. Yeah. I, uh, I, I just, I laughed, I, I laughed because earlier you said, uh, Trey really, really, really liked playing leads. And on that, on that video, it's like, it's like, I think he up, I think he even, uh, he played leads even longer or, or more on the songs. It's just, it's just ree, ree, on the video because it's a side, side stage. It's, I guess it's on his side of the stage. Right. Uh, on the video. And all you hear is like, ree, 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 you know, him, him shredding yeah. away. So. One thing we, you know, like before we had a vocalist, we used to just get up there and we'd play one song for like 20 minutes and just, uh, yeah, we would just like extend that, you know, bands like Zeppelin do that all the time. Um, yeah. Jam you know, a five minute song and make a 20 minute song out of it. And, and that's kind of like what we were doing back then. We just kind of like took all our songs, even though they were shorter, we just like take the lead areas and just, jam out for a while until we were ready to like, you know, until Trey was kind of finished. <laughs> then he kind of yeah. gave us that look like, okay, let's go back into the rhythm. So we kind of <laughs> like yeah. those songs, you know, that song morbid angel that we had back then. Yeah. Which became, uh, I forgot what it, it became. Was. Uh, it became a incubus song though. Was it engulfed in unspeakable? No, 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 no. It became a, a, a morbid angel song on, Oh, um, one of their later albums. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I'm not sure. Somebody, somebody in the in the in the chat, let us know what song there is. Cause I don't know. I forget. Yeah, I, I can't think of it now. But um, most of those rhythms that were in that song. But we used to do that Morbid Angel song. Sometimes it'd be like a 15 minute song. We right. kind of got it from Satan's Fall. You know how long Satan's Fall is. Yeah. Uh, well, Fate song. So when they they had that one really long song, we're like, let's do a, lo a really long song ourselves and just go crazy and put a bunch of weird stuff in it. And, our, it was sort of like our uh, Satan's Fall or, or uh, um, At War with Satan from yeah. Venom. You know, we wanted to do a really long song, too. So that's what Morbid Angel was. Invocation of the Continual one, I think, is what it ended up being. Oh, yeah. Is it, is it what it's I'm not familiar. I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, Morbid Angel, like later albums at all. So. But yeah, did he, somebody that's... it's funny, the, the stuff that he didn't use right away on altars was used on several other morbid angel records. It's, it was kind of funny to hear like on the fourth and fifth morbid angel records, still rhythms from when I was in the band. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I think they, I think they did angel of disease or something later on too. Yeah. They did that and they did hell spawn too, or whatever. Oh, they uh, wow. You know, yeah. later on as well, that was on like their fourth or fifth record. So it, 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 it was funny that some of these rhythms that we used to play in 1985 surfaced like, you know, on their fifth, fifth, fourth and fifth record. Yeah, there we go. I knew somebody would let us know. Invocation of the continual one. Right. That's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. On, on, uh, I guess formulas fatal or formulas fatal, or I don't know the exact title of that album, but, uh, hell spawn is on formulas. Okay. I got you. Yeah. So some of that stuff that are on formulas, was actually from 1985. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on now. A brief, uh, well, I guess we can briefly touch on it because the band was around for a very brief time. But uh, and I'm wearing the shirt today. But uh, this demo, uh, I don't know. Obviously, back then you didn't, you didn't, you had no idea the kind of impact it would have. You know, thirty something years later, but. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the impact this demo has had on the underground scene uh, over the years, but man, this demo is just like three songs of just like perfectly like executed like evil metal to me. And uh, uh, I don't know if you can briefly kind of discuss discuss uh, putting this demo together. Yeah, it, what was strange with that was um, after we recorded abominations uh we recorded the record and and johnny ortega and myself and richard all got sent back to tampa and david kept trey there by himself i wonder why uh <laughs> maybe because he was looking for a guitar player and he, to mix the record so i mean there was ideas i wanted to do on abominations for my vocals that i didn't get to do at all because it's like and we didn't know we were going to be sent back either after the recording was through was david vincent was just like okay see y'all later Go back home. I don't mean to cut you off, but what did you want to do? That I don't think I've ever heard uh, you talk about different ideas of vocals that you wanted to do. 
what exactly was that? Well, just different, you know, like, you know, echoes here, oh, okay. Okay. here things, you know, effect wise things, not, not you. actually um, different singing wise, but um, different kinds of effects and things, yeah. ideas that I had that I would have liked to put into the songs. Uh, and we all got sent back and he kept Trey there by himself. So when Trey came back, the first thing he said to me was, we got to get rid of Johnny Ortega, our bass player. He said his tracks are just horrible. And, and of course, David played bass. Um, <laughs> so I wondered what was going on there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, but the weird thing was David knew this guy named Sterling. And, and uh, he's, he's like, David knows this bass player in Atlanta named Sterling Scarborough. And we've already talked to him and, and uh, we're going to fire Johnny after these, these, uh, these shows that we have coming up, the two Rocky point shows. Yeah. We're going to, I'm going to fire Johnny and we're going to bring in Sterling. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and instead of, cause we were going to release the album in September. And then uh, uh, what happened was they wanted to redo the bass tracks and take Johnny's bass tracks off of there and put Sterling's on. So yeah. in July, uh, Sterling came down in late June, early July. Uh, I think it was late June. And, uh, yep. And, and so Sterling became the, the bass player in Morbid Angel right there at the end. Yeah. If you go on YouTube, I don't have it on my channel, but there is a, a rehearsal tape. Some guys from Europe had come over and recorded, uh, not video, but audio of us practicing with Sterling and we're actually, you know, reanimators mutilations. Um, yeah. those, those incubus songs were going to be Morbid Angel songs. Yeah. They were Incubus songs when Sterling was in Atlanta. He had a band called Incubus before he joined Morbid Angel, but it had split up. So when Sterling came to Tampa and joined Morbid Angel, he said, I've got some songs, you know, that I'd like to bring into Morbid Angel. You know, if you let me join, you know, if I join the band, I'd like to do these songs. So Trey was like, OK, you know, let's try it and see what happens. So uh, Reanimator's Mutilation was actually a song we played live one time. Uh, as at the last morbid angel show that we did with Sterling, we only oh, did wow. one show with Sterling, uh, but we played uh, reanimators mutilations and I sang it live. And uh, after, and then, you know, morbid angel split in half and Sterling and I Sterling was at that point. He's just like, let's just redo my band incubus. You know, those songs are mine and, and, you know, I've got more. And so I was like, okay. So we kind of, we got, you know, as a guitar player, and became a three piece and Sterling was singing at that point. Yeah. And I just played drums on it. Cause the stuff was even faster than what we were doing in morbid angel. And yeah, crazy. Super fast. yeah. And I was like, well, I don't mind not having to sing this stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sterling was like a whole bunch of crazy lyrics and with long words. And, and I was like, man, I don't know if I can sing and play all this stuff. You know, at the time I was like, Whoa. And he's like, well, I know that, you know, I can do it. No problem. So I was like, you know, we, we, the weird thing was, is we had a house that we rented the three of us and yeah. we had no PA at the time. So, so Sterling never sang. Yeah. So we didn't know how he could sing at all. You know, we already knew how I could sing cause I was, had already recorded abominations, Yeah. but, um, when we went in the studio and recorded uh, the Incubus demo, we did it in, in one night. It, it was, it was, uh, we had never heard Sterling sing before. And I remember Gina, we finished all the recording of the music and then me and, and Sterling didn't want anybody in the studio when he sang, he didn't want us in there. <laughs> so I remember me and Gina were sitting outside of the studio. Yeah. It was a real studio in Tampa. And, uh, I think it was called London Music, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct. I'm not quite sure what the studio was called, but I think it was called London Music because uh, Sterling was had booked the studio. He had found it and booked it and liked it. And, you yeah. know, that's what we wanted to record. So we were like, okay, because uh, he paid for the demo. And, uh, and I remember Gino and I sitting outside of the thing and we could hear him just saying, because we couldn't hear the music anymore. Because yeah. it was in headphones, and we all we heard was him doing these crazy screams and you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell is this? And then we listened back to it, and it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah, so, fuck yeah. But you know, the thing was, after we recorded that demo, we started working on a couple more new songs, 
And um, yeah, talking about doing a, a live thing pretty soon, and, and things like that, and uh, you know, like playing live again, and and um, then Gino and and Sterling went to the beach one day, and they got into a big argument while they were drunk over some girls, and Gino quit, and Sterling was like totally flipping out, and and it was just too much, you know, and and I at that point I was just. Gina's like, I'm done with this. I'm never going to jam with that guy again, blah, 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 you know? And, and I was like, oh, man, not again. And uh, at that point, I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm done with this whole situation. Yeah. Sterling was a maniac. He used to do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, he was really out of his mind. And he ended up killing himself, uh, you know. Yeah. I think it's been 12 or 13 years now. Um, yeah. But he – uh he used to do all kinds of crazy stuff and try to get in fights all the time. And, 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 you know, he tried to get in a fight with Gino and Gino beat him up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just too, too much for me to even want to deal with all the time like yeah, that 24 hours a day. The guy was just nuts. <laughs> and, um, yeah. your, your vocal, your, uh, your, 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 uh, microphone just got really low. I can barely hear you. How about now? Better? No. Oh, huh, strange. I, can't I don't really know why. For some reason, nothing's changed. Well, I saw a phone call come in on my. Oh, I don't my, know. Uh, yeah, I can. I, I mean, I'm still. Head. I'm still. Uh, I haven't changed anything. I don't know if you can hear me now. Yeah, something you, happened on my end because of a phone call that came in. Yeah. And it cut no, your vocal. Yeah, I can hear you just as fine as I did a while ago. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm all the way up on my uh, volume, but I can. I mean, I can hear you, but it's barely. I can, to... uh, I can, I uh, can, I can talk louder. <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, I can barely hear it, but at least uh, I'll just have to really listen when you're talking. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So well, anyway, uh, you know, apparently that's when I decided. Uh, that's when I decided to just do my own band and do my own thing and get new people. Yeah. And that's when I came up with Nocturnus and and uh, got okay. Vince and and uh, Bateman in the band first. It was just a three piece again. So. Yeah. Uh, that's how it kind of started again on, on that. Oh, something yeah. just, yep. Yeah. And, and yeah. in the beginning, it was just a three piece and Gino wasn't in the band. Uh, but right before we went to record, Gino came back and started playing with me again. And he's like, you know, he heard, he heard we were doing shows as a three piece. We did a few shows as a three piece with just, uh, Vince on guitar and me and Richard Bateman on bass. And, uh, Gino came to one of the shows. He's like, oh, you know, I'd like to start playing with you again. And I, I was like, you know, okay. So we brought him back in the band and we recorded that first demo there. Yeah. And What's that was that? Uh, 1987. So it wasn't, that was in the same year as we did the Incubus demo. So everything kind of happened kind of fast like that. Yeah. This, uh, and if y'all missed it at the beginning, uh, uh, Mike did mention that on the next uh, Nocturnus AD, they're going to do the track Nocturnus, I believe, right? Yes, this is exactly. One? Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, this, uh, and, and I, I, I mentioned the two songs, Entity and uh, uh, Unholy Fury, which you said uh, Vince had brought with him to the band. But uh, I mean, to me, your vocals on here, are, it, it's, it's almost exactly like Abominations of Desolation to me. I don't know what you thought, but I, it was still totally Morbid Angel like style vocals on this. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it, it was. Uh, this is 80, 87 that this yeah. demo was recorded in, and and yeah. Abominations was in eighty six. So it really wasn't that long after 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 that, you know. Yeah. So my vocals. I don't know what happened to my my vocals. Just kind of changed on their own. I, I really don't try to sing any certain way when I sing. Uh, I guess because I'm playing drums and everything, and it just kind of comes out the way it does. So I I I never try to strain and get really low or do this right. or that i just kind of like let it come out on its own and and however it ends up coming out is how it sounds <laughs> well it fucking works that's all i know um and then after this one let me see i don't know if i have a copy of or, but i always i always thought this logo is really cool that that logo on the on that demo but uh uh who who uh did you do this logo or who did this no um that was done by a guy named alan uh we used to call him brain dead 
uh, he's uh, he was Vince's friend. Oh, okay. Uh, and he was always hanging around Vince, and he was an artist, and he came up with that first logo like that. And then after he drew that one, um, Vince was out of the band. Yeah, because he had, he moved up north to Pittsburgh, and he wanted to do Asher on his own kind of project at that point. Yeah. So um, when that happened. I, I uh, there was a guy that was renting an apartment that my mom had built onto the side of her house, a guy named Ron, and he he was a friend of mine for for a while too, and uh, he did the second Nocturnus logo, which was on the Science of Horror, and yeah. uh, he t- kind of took that first logo and redesigned it, and and uh, ever since then, Ron's still a friend of mine, and and uh, he's done all the Nocturnus logos, every one of them. Uh, like the first one on the key he did, uh, yeah. how it changed a little bit for thresholds. He did that one. And then uh, I got in touch with him again when I started Nocturnus AD and uh, he redid, he did the Nocturnus AD logo. And uh, so he's been, you know, kind of like a friend of mine since the beginning. And right after that first logo, he did everything after that. Yeah. Uh, just to answer this uh, individual, yes, he was talking about Vincent Crowley uh, when he was in uh, Nocturnus on the uh, on the first demo. So just clearing that up. Uh, all right, so the key, you bring, bring up the key. I've heard you talk about, uh, like, when you guys went to record that, um, I'm glad that you used Tom Morris on it. But, uh, I mean, at the time, it was Scott Burns this, Scott Burns that. Uh, and I think I've heard you speak that he wasn't available at the time or something like that or did you or or maybe you you planned on using Tom Morris the whole time but to me I'm glad you used him because that album sounds great to me well it it definitely doesn't sound like what usually comes out of Morris sound though um that's one thing about the key I I don't think it has that Morris sound sound that that Scott Burns had Um, but good for me though yeah, I mean, you know, I'm kind of glad that we didn't get labeled that because I know, I, I mean, everybody loves Scott, and I think Scott's yeah. a great person and everything. But what was weird was like after a while, it became like uh, almost people didn't want to use Scott because he had the Scott Burns sound, you know. But when when for the first few years, everybody loved everything that he did, and I did too, of course. And and but to tell you the truth. I really wanted to use Jim Morris myself. Oh, okay. And the reason in being was the Nasty Savage record. I thought the Nasty Savage record, that first one, Jim Morris yeah. did that. And it I just great. loved the sound of that first Nasty Savage record. Everything was just right there in your face. It had a great sound. And it, it sounded real. Um, not Nothing sampled. It, it was like, you know what I mean? It sounded really good. Um, yeah. But what happened was, you know, we were signed to Earache, of course, and and Tom Morris did the first Morbid Angel record. And yeah. so Digby was like, nope, you guys are going to use Tom Morris because he did Morbid Angel. It, that is that. And I I was like, but I, I'd like to use Jim, actually. And, and uh, you know, they were like, and Dig was like, nope, if, if you want to be on Earache, it, you know, and, and record it more sound, it's going to be Tom Morris. Wow. So we didn't have a choice, really. And, and not that I don't like Tom or anything. It's just I really liked that Nasty Savage first record. Right. I really liked the sound of it. And because, I mean, Tom did a fantastic job, of course, with Alters and everything yeah. that he's done there. I mean, he's not a there's not a bad person that's ever worked at more sound when it comes to running sound. Everybody had their own little thing and, and 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 as far as sound goes it's such a uh personal preference you know yeah with the way things sound on records and i just really liked jim's stuff that he did and i i kind of wanted to have him do our record uh and there was nothing wrong with tom doing it uh but the reason he did it was because digby said this is what's going to happen <laughs> man all right, so but I, I remember when I when uh, 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 yeah Jim Moore Jim Morrison Jim Morris also engineered Sabotage's Sirens. Yeah, I did. So there you go. So, uh, when I first got the album, I mean, 
I don't, I'm not, I just remember hearing that creepy intro and then the <laughs> or Lake of Fire or whatever. But I mean, that, that album just, just I, I think I was 15 when I heard that. It just blew me away. Uh, it was like evil and it was like totally different than anything that was that was that was out at the time. Uh, somebody mentioned it earlier. I mean, I think the keyboards came in like on the second demo, right? On Science of Horror. And right. then and then I've heard, I think I've heard you speak, or maybe I read somewhere that Earache wanted you to record like a rehearsal or something like that before uh with like two guitar players. Is that right? Before like saying, okay, we'll put an album out. Um, no, no, they loved they loved the science of horror. Okay. Um, so that that no, what happened was after I was out of Nocturnus, and they got they didn't tell Dig that they had fired me or were going to fire me. Yeah. And then once they fired me, they told Earache, and Earache said, "You guys better go in the studio with that new drummer and record two songs, a couple of songs, before you do your third album." And so they went in the studio and recorded those two songs that uh, Mummified oh. and uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Possess the Possessed Priest, the Priest. I think. And the yeah. funny thing was, Possess the Priest was an old Nocturnus song from 1987 before mm. any of those guys in Nocturnus were even in the band. Yeah, yeah. And that was a song <laughs> me and Gino and Bateman wrote. Yeah. And I think even Vince wrote, helped write some of that song, Possess the Priest. And and I wrote the lyrics, but then they changed the lyrics uh, when they did that. But um, yeah, Eric told him, you guys got rid of, you know, the, the founding member, you know, and I know he's not singing anymore, but still and uh eric said go record a couple songs of what's going to be on the third record and yeah. uh so they did and eric dropped them wow uh so the the only i mean then I, like i said i was 15 and i i, I remember getting the I, I bought everything on tapes then but the photo the photo always kind of threw me off a little bit i'm not gonna lie i'm like oh there's when i first got it i'm like what the hell you know because it seems like there's a lot of uh how can I put this hair product or something like that? I don't know. I don't know if this was a label's idea or what happened. Uh, do you remember this photo shoot? Uh, yeah, actually, it was kind of funny because I, at the time I was dating a girl that was a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we went well, with a leather jacket now. picture type where all of us were wearing one. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, she she's like, well, you know, and we had actually a, uh, Eric could set it up with a professional photographer to take the pictures. Yeah. And, and you know, for the album, since it was going to be on the inside of the album and yeah. uh, they wanted real professional pictures, of course. Yeah. And, and uh, so we went to a real studio to, to take these pictures. And since my girlfriend was a hairstylist, she's like, Oh, let me do all y'all's hair. You know? So <laughs> wow. we did, and it just kind of <laughs> came out that way. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, that's that's. That, I mean, I, I, like I said, I've been, I've been wondering that for like, you know, I was like, there's there's got to be a story to this. And then your hands, like just little things. What you know, back then you would stare at like tape tape covers for like hours and try to dissect every single thing. Your hands was that was that was that anything you were doing there? You just just happened to be standing that way or doing I that. I just with happened your to hands? be standing that way. I just didn't. <laughs> I don't even know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's just little things you notice when you're like a kid and like, like I said, looking at, at stuff and all, you know, so I just figured I'd bring that up. So yeah, it's kind of uh, funny. I, I mean, it's like at the time you, you don't really think of those things. And, yes. you know, it's, when other people get the record and then they start thinking of these things and introspecting, oh, I wonder if he did this on purpose or I wonder if that was done on purpose. And really it wasn't done on, nothing was done on purpose except for the the girl that I was dating styling our hair, you know, and <laughs> That's awesome I don't even think that. there was, we even looked at ourselves in the mirror, you know, we, we didn't really care. It's just right, like right. she did our hair and we had all these real lights, you know, with the umbrellas behind them. And wow. you know, we had the real nice 35 millimeter camera and it was in a studio and everything. So, uh, you know, it was like the first time we ever did anything like that with, the, I mean, before that we always just, used to go to graveyards and broken down buildings and take pictures with a, you know, a camera, a regular camera. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, that was the first time we ever actually had like real, uh, you know, pictures done in a studio. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the second album, I mean, I, 
I, I think it's got some good songs, but for, I, I could never get used to the different vocals on that album myself. Uh, it just seemed like it's like it's like the guy was trying to sing without singing. I don't know. It just it, it never it never captured me at all. Uh, the vocals on that. I mean, yeah, there was there was some good songs. So uh, I don't know what you think about that Thresholds album all these years later. Well, I mean, it, it's it's I, I wish it would have been different than it was. It it for for everything that happened, it still turned out to be pretty good. The bass player on there, um, we just had him. He, he didn't want to tour. Uh, Chris, yeah. he, I still talk to him every once in a while too on Facebook. Oh. But he he was a really good bass player, and he was friends with you know all the other guys and and uh, Jeff. We had fired Jeff because of his drinking and all that. Yeah. And uh, so and we had got another guy Jim to do the tour. And we didn't know the guy. He was from like Fort Lauderdale. Then we we instantly we had these two tours booked, and we're like, "What are we gonna do? We don't have a bass player." So we kind of got this guy Jim Sullivan uh, from uh, from Fort Lauderdale, and we didn't know him at all. And then yeah. you know, like, so he jumps on the bus with us. This is the, like the first, you know, we, he practiced with us for about a month, but he just would drive up on the weekend and play with us and leave. So we didn't really get to know the guy at all. And then like he jumps on the bus with us on a tour bus, and then we're like you know, for a couple months with this guy and he's like talking to himself and arguing yeah. with himself and, and starting trouble with people on tour all the time. And so when the two tours were done, we kind of just got rid of him. And then we were, it was like, it was already time to do the second record and we didn't have anybody again. And uh, so Chris came in and, and, and uh, recorded the bass on, on the, on the record, but he didn't want to be in a touring band or anything like that at the time. Yeah. So he just kind of came in and helped us out and recorded the, the tracks. Yeah. Now I'm going back because I forgot, but this was the first time uh, a lot of people outside of Florida got to see you guys play live uh, on the the '91 Grind Crusher tour. Uh, was that was that a was that a cool experience for you guys or for you personally being on that tour back then? It was amazing. I mean, but we did do um, the before that we did do the Bolt Thrower tour in Europe. Oh, okay. And that was like 20, 20 something shows. I think there's 20 or 25 shows somewhere right around in there with bolt thrower. Oh, okay. And, uh, so we kind of, that was our first tour actually, um, that yeah. we did, uh, when, when, th when the, the key was released and, uh, yeah. that was in early like January and February of, of 91. Yeah. And, and, uh, that went really well. And then we, we had like a month or two down, and we went right onto that tour right there, the Grind Crusher tour in the U.S. Yeah. And that was huge. We had like two big tour buses, and you know, there's tons of money being thrown around and with, with this. And and we went into so much of it. I mean, the label back then, labels used to throw out tour support money like it was nothing. Yeah. Because they knew they would, you know, back then people would sell, you know, fifty thousand records, no problem. And and so a record label had no problems throwing out 20 or 30 grand for a band to go on tour with the tour buses and pay for all that ahead of time. And then hopefully recoup the money during the tour. Yeah. Well, so what happened was when we, when we did that, that tour, we were making $150 a night and that was going to pay back this $20,000 bill. <laughs> so uh, we ended up in huge amount of debt after we Damn. did that, that tour yeah, uh, because we just didn't have it, you know, we didn't make the money back. And so all of our record sales basically went to paying the tour support and and the recording budget. And we never yeah. really saw any money from the key because because the label took it all back. Mm. Uh, I know they did give us, you know, 20 or 25 grand. It cost us with the tour bus and, you know, the driver had to be paid. The hotel rooms had to be paid. The food every day, you know, we got money for food every day 10 or 15 dollars a day and all that had to be paid back before yeah. we ever saw royalty and so we you know plus that i think it was an eight or nine thousand dollar recording budget that we ended up with for the key and and you know like after all that was paid back we had nothing in our yeah. pockets yeah so we kind of went into the second record thresholds where we were just like kind of broke even and didn't really make any money so we thought, well, Eric was like, you guys need a, a front man because 
you did these two tours and all, everybody's saying, you know, that the guitar players aren't moving around on stage, the keyboard players behind the keyboards and the drummers, the vocalist, but he's behind this huge drum set and you can't even see him. <laughs> so they said, either you quit playing drums and become the front man and get out there in front and get the crowd going, or you play drums and get a front man and have some, but you need somebody up front and yeah. you could guys could do so much better. And so that's why we ended up with the vocalists that we did on the second record. Uh, we tried a bunch of people out, but Dan was just the one that kind of sounded even close to what I was doing. And uh, some yeah. people were so far away that we tried out vocal wise, you know, <laughs> it just it was like, no. Anybody and, notable? And, uh, like anybody we would know? No, no, there was nobody big that really tried out for the band. It was weird. It, it was like when we, uh, when we put it out that we were going to get a vocalist, we only had people from our area really trying out. Yeah. So we never had like the money to fly somebody in and let them try out or something like that from some other country right. or state or like people do now, you know, everybody collaborates from all over the world on one record. Yeah, exactly. They don't so, have but to the leave back your house. Then, that really didn't happen, you know, yeah. too, too often. Uh, and with us, especially because we were a new band, even though the key was doing really well in sales, it still, like I said, it didn't cover the expenses that we had from doing the two tours and being the opening band in both tours. We were really not making any money yeah. you know, and nowhere near what we were spending to do these tours and plane tickets and, you know, things like that. So we ended up way far in debt. Well, not really in debt, but we broke even to where we never saw any money. Right. And so we went into the second album and did one tour and, it didn't recoup hardly any money comparatively to, to and threshold sold it like a third of what the key did. And yeah. the label was just like, Whoa, you guys, what, what's going on here? And, you know, I'm like telling dig, well, you're the one that wanted us to get a vocalist, you know? And of course <laughs> it was still our fault. Well, you didn't get the right one, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> so, and then, uh, so the guys in the band wanted to become the next dream theater. Cause dream theater was getting huge. Oh. And they wanted to go that route. And I was like, you know, I think we should just go back to what we were doing before and let me sing again. And yeah. that's when they all went against me and, and stole the name from me and, and kicked me out. And like I said, Eric said, now you kicked out the only original member, you know, what, what are you going to do now <laughs> and record a couple songs and let's see what you got now, you know, without yeah. him in the band either. And they did. And Eric was like, Nope, sorry, you're off the label. Man, do you uh do you remember this uh in store in Houston on that tour? It was an in store. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, that's a flyer from just that's uh there was a record store called Sound Plus. Uh, there was actually a flyer just for the in store. Uh, and my uh my buddy Kevin G provided me with a couple of photos. From uh, that day, here's one of, I don't know if you've seen it before or not, but this is you at that record store, at that record signing, at that in-store. <laughs> so this yeah, is, uh, I, I remember uh, we did a few, quite a few record signings on that tour, but I remember the one, one of them in Texas, I think we did three shows in Texas. Now I remember one of them, I don't know if it was this one or if we did another one or not, um, but it was really, really good. There was a lot of people there. And uh, I remember this girl like whipped out her boobs and had us sign her boobs. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it was kind of funny. And then I remember the guy in the record store just giving us a whole bunch of stuff for free. Like, oh, yeah. go pick out a couple CDs and, eh, you know, get this. If you want a T-shirt, you know, it was like, wow, we ended up getting a lot of really cool stuff from, I believe it was this place. Yeah, Sound Plus was, one of the Sound Plus was awesome. Yeah, we played so. in Texas, but uh, and I know that we went in that other really famous place called the Metal Shop or something. Uh, oh, yeah, that's in California somewhere, maybe. Or yeah, no? we did that one too, and the guy was like that there too. He was like, "Good, you know, here's some shirts, and go go pick out some, uh, you know, here's some promo stuff if you want it." You know, like they were giving us all kinds of really cool swag. You know, I think I came home from that tour with like a whole suitcase of stuff that people gave me demos, <laughs> CDs, and shirts and it was great here's a here's a photo from the actual venue that show in houston uh it was called the after dark club 
of hmm. you way back then. Uh, I've never seen that photo before. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 from the Houston show from the Grind Crusher tour. Uh, my buddy Kevin had he took that. So uh, yeah, that's one I've never seen before. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you got the uh, you got all that merch money, the mer merch money in the uh, in the uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? fanny packs? Fanny pack? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was funny. Mike Davis, he's, we called those bitch bags. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another they were really photo. popular back then though but yeah they were cool. yeah, I mean, especially when you were in europe because back then you really had to keep your passport on you and you were dealing with uh like several different currencies yeah so you had coins from like you know england you had coins from holland you had coins from germany and you know it was like you yeah. needed something to keep all this stuff in yeah 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 and, so you know, that's people getting on your tour bus and stuff stuff comes up missing all the time so it was best to keep everything that you had right there in your little bitch bag <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought oh uh, yeah i was like i didn't know if you had seen those before or not but i thought that was that was pretty cool of him to uh, oh yeah, we always the, made jokes about those things, the, you know? uh, but they were handy to use because you know you were able to put uh you know other stuff illegal stuff in there and you know things like that that people couldn't see <laughs> he still he still has his uh his ticket from the show too uh, April 11th, 1991. Insane. Damn, I love the way they spelled Nocturnus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's another cool thing. <laughs> I've never seen that before. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and God flash is two words instead of one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. Thought, thought maybe you'd get a kick out of seeing those old, uh, I think that, so, uh, if I remember correctly, I believe that that um, that club was in like a strip mall. The After Dark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't around. I don't think it was around very long, from what I remember. Uh, there was some shows there. Uh, oh yeah, we have a lot of people chiming in on drummer singers that uh, Eric was dumb for for thinking you should be singing. Chris Ryford of Autopsy. Uh, Paul Ledney, uh, who else was there? King Fowley from Deceased did it for a long time. Yeah, he's a good uh, friend of mine now. We we, uh, we got to meet a couple of times, and when we played in Atlanta, we we played with them, and uh, and I got yeah. to meet King in, in person, and he's a great yeah. dude, man. Oh, he's the best. That guy would tell you stories that, that will just crack you up all night long. Yeah, he's the best. He's he's the yeah, best. He's, 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 he's really yeah. cool. I'm trying. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm I'm gonna get him on here. He's just kind of you know he's still stuck in the in the stone ages with uh with uh, technology you know so but I'll have him on here. Uh, yeah, you what, gotta get King on there. You'll have a great yeah, time with him. Yeah. And then uh, this picture is awesome. I took this off your page, but uh, <laughs> uh, that had to be uh, amazing meeting him, right? It was it was crazy. We we played Hellfest in France, and of course. We were in the tent stage. In the tent stage, we were playing. Um, a Slayer was the headliner in the tent stage. Yeah. So you can imagine how big that. And this was only what, maybe, ten years ago, I think. Oh, wow. And Iron Maiden was playing the big stage. And after we played, they played right after us outside. So when we got finished playing in the tent, we walked outside, and there was Iron Maiden playing live outside. It was like this is incredible. Um, so after we had played uh, and I watched Iron Maiden, I went backstage and that picture is backstage in the cafeteria oh. room. Wow. So I'm getting a dessert and all of a sudden I look next to me and, and, and there's Nico standing right next to me looking at the desserts too. And I was like, oh, dude, can we do like a funny picture together? And he's like, yeah, man, let's, let's do it. <laughs> so we made like funny faces and took a picture and, it turned out really classic. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, that's I have another movie. picture with him too, which is funny because I I actually ran into him again, um, in Tampa. He uh did he's a golfer, and yeah, he lives in Florida, right? He's a I guess he does quite a bit of golfing, and yeah. I didn't know that, but I heard on the radio that he was going to be at a big golfing event, a charity event, and they actually had the bass player from uh. Bon Jovi's band too. There, I forgot what his name is. Tito I'm sure somebody will tell us. 
Oh, is he yeah. is he the Tico Torres or whatever? His name yeah, is? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they both were the two. Oh. Lost them again. Stars that were there that weekend. So yeah. I was like, and there's like maybe a hundred people out there guest wise. And Nico yeah. had a band called the McBrainiacs. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, it's a cover band where he yeah. plays drums and a bunch of his friends, you know, are the other musicians. Yeah. Um, so actually they were playing too. So I went out Damn. there and there was only like a, maybe 150 people there. Yeah, you know, and it was so funny because they got done playing, and I went up and said, "Hey, you remember me from uh, Hellfest?" And he's like, "Oh my god, that's pretty cool." So we got—I got another picture on my Facebook page. I have to—I'll send it to you. Um, of me awesome. and Nico on the side stage there in Tampa. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Now, I think he lives yeah, it was in Florida, called the right? Brainiacs. That was his, his yeah. uh, little cover band project. I thought I heard he lived in Florida and has some kind of restaurant or something in Florida somewhere. Yeah, it's a South Florida. He lives down there by Fort Lauderdale. He's got a uh, Nico McBrain's rib rib shack. I don't know what it's called. That's I've right. Never, That's right. I've never yeah, been there, but um, I know he's there quite often. Yeah. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh man, I gotta ask him about that. Yeah, he's a really cool. friendly, cool, cool guy. I mean, he's yeah. for how big of a band they are, he's definitely not stuck up or anything like that. You know, he's he's very, yeah. very cool to talk to. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, I, I've, I've kept you here. Like, I just realized how long we've been going. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you mind. Uh, hey, if anybody has any questions uh, in like two minutes, tops, so uh, I can let Mike go. Uh, but I know if there was a couple of questions that I probably missed. But uh, uh, if you don't mind sticking around for like two minutes, I know I've kept sure. you here a long time already. But uh, I think one, the Incubus, somebody brought up the Incubus, the, the, this artwork. Who did that? Uh huh. Who did the artwork? You know, um, I think he said a guy named Rich had did the artwork. Um, he had that band Incubus before he even joined Morbid Angel. Right. And he already had the artwork done. Somebody in Atlanta drew that. And I think he said it was his old drummer. I'm not really sure on that. Um, but I classic. I know it's great artwork. Yeah. But that was around before I even met Sterling, that artwork. He already had that done. That's awesome. But um, the shirts, though, that he did make those shirts, uh, well, you know, when we got the band going, he's like, I'm going to print up some, you know, a couple hundred shirts. I think there's about 200 of those, the original ones that were made. Yeah. Uh, somebody earlier asked, I think I remembered, uh, I guess Earache, how can I put this nicely? Uh, do they still pay you anything? Dude, they haven't paid me anything since since 1991. Uh, damn. The worst part they, is, you know, if you go on their merchandise right? store, they've got more Nocturnus merchandise. They've got sweatpants. They've got shirts. They've got hoodies. We never even had that stuff when we were in the band. They had, yeah. you know, a couple shirts and a couple long sleeve shirts. But it's like now they have more Nocturnus merchandise than they had when we were signed to the label. And they're still selling it to this day. They've done... God knows how many fucking releases of the key and, yeah, and a couple of thresholds and and they've even sold like multicolored versions to Century Media put a put out like five different colors of the key and I never Man. got any I never even got it one copy of those things that Century Media put out or or any wow. merchandise like like shirts or sweatpants or any of that stuff that they sell now on their web store on earrings web store and we have yeah. none of this even after i was out of the band they still didn't even get any money mike davis told me he said no man earrings never sent us anything either so is there any it, way it, for you guys to get like the rights to that or is that just i i don't know it's it's kind of i don't even want to mess with it to tell you the truth you. It's, it'd be more of a hassle than uh It'd probably even be worth at this point. Yeah. Uh, do you have? Do you guys have any anything uh, planned uh, live? Like maybe by the end of this year or anything? Well, I mean, the main thing is right now we want to finish writing these songs for the next record, and, oh, yeah. and hopefully get the recording done too before the end of the year, and and so we can put out another record. But everything we had booked, 
uh, for 2021 or 2020, I should say, that was supposed to go on in 2021, yeah. uh, like Maryland Death Fest, yeah, uh, like yeah. Brutal Assault, uh, Party Sands, um, another, I think, I don't know if that one's going to happen, but we had the, you know, some pretty big festivals booked, and every one of them has been postponed to 2022 now. So actually, we've got it, you know, I, and I'm pretty sure they're going to happen in 2022. So I think that well, I know Maryland Death Fest is already uh, rescheduled for 2022 in May, and we're on that. And uh, Brutal Assault's already rescheduled for 2022 in August, and we're on that still. And uh, I believe Party Sands says they're still going to do the festival this summer, but I can't see it happening, to yeah. tell you the truth, in Europe. And uh, it's the same weekend as, as, as uh, Brutal Assault. So we were supposed to fly – in and play brutal assault then take a bus over to party sands and play party sands and then fly back from party sands and our tickets were already bought and everything because it was supposed to be in 2020 yeah. so now um brutal assaults changed their schedule to 2022 but party sands is still saying they're going to try to have their festival this summer so i really don't because there were several bands that were going to play both festivals because i guess yeah. the promoters uh you know since brutal assaults in prague and uh, Party Sands is in Germany. The the two um, promote. Uh oh, just lost them. <laughs> we'll see if he calls. We'll see if he comes back. Uh, but I think that's it. I'm gonna let him go. Uh, if if he comes back or not, um, it was awesome. Appreciate everybody everybody being here, man. Uh, uh, Mike rules. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed the chat. I did. Oh, look, there he is. I'm back. That's right. All right, all right. That's fast. I tipped the phone uh, sideways and it fell over and it hung up. <laughs> uh, that's all right. You got Sorry my quick. But um, it's weird because Party Sands is still saying they're going to have their festival this summer, but every other festival is canceled, every single one of them. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen because, like I said, we were supposed to fly in and play Brutal Assault and then take a bus, like an eight-hour bus drive from Brutal Assault to Party Sands in the same weekend and play. One yeah. Friday to Saturday. So I don't know how this is going to work now because uh, the plane tickets were already bought for, for that. And supposedly they've been changed over to 2022 now. Um, but Party Sands is still trying to hang on for this summer. So I really don't. I'm, it's still kind of up in the air with what's going to happen with that. Yeah, that's a pretty big fest, right? Party Sands? They're both huge. Yeah, huge? Both yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen like footages and there's like a lot of people there, yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen with that because our plane tickets supposedly were changed to 2022 now. And yeah. uh, so supposedly the one promoter for Brutal Assault paid for us to get there and the Party Sands guy paid for us to go back. Yeah. And they split the cost of the two uh, flights. And yeah. so now supposedly if we play Party Sands this summer, we've only got a way back from there, but we don't have the tickets to there. So yeah. I, I know it's a big mess. Yeah, that could be a problem. Um, I I I don't know what's going to happen at this point, but we could be playing Party Sands this summer, yeah. uh, in August. But I don't know if that's going to happen because of the fact that the way those two festivals were in the same weekend and connected, and several of the bands, like almost half the bands, were playing both. And yeah. uh, you know, they were all we were going to share a bus with a couple of bands that were playing Brutal Assault on Friday and traveling to Party Sands on Saturday and to play there. So we weren't the only band doing it. So yeah, I, really, I mean that makes sense. Yeah, I mean it does make sense to for the promoters to work together that way. Yeah. And um, since they're in different countries, they don't really bother. Both festivals still do ten thousand people, you know. So they don't, you know, they sell out both of them. So yeah, yeah they're big. It's kind of cool that the promoters are working together like they do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, now you're back loud again, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to do, I guess. Hang up. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I, I thank you, thank you very much for for joining me. I know I kept you. Uh, I usually try to keep them uh, at a certain time, but uh, under a certain amount of time. But I uh, appreciate your patience with me, and uh, thank you for joining me, man. It was it was awesome talking to you. But you know everything. I look forward to the new Nocturnus AD. Uh, I know I do, especially after that album that came out. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'll I'll be going into it a lot more uh, 
uh, what's the word, confident <laughs> as, as I was the first yeah. one thinking. <laughs> well, if, you like paradox, if you like paradox, I think you'll like what we're doing now. I yeah. mean, the new stuff is definitely following right along. Yeah, and those guys you have in the band are amazing, man. The two yeah. guitar players and yeah, just... so we're all still the same. So you know, we're we're yeah. uh, all the the general writing is from the same people, and uh, I, I know that doesn't always mean anything because you know yeah, some yeah. completely change from one album to the other with the same members. But we definitely uh, with these new songs, we've kind of tried to keep the same kind of um, you know style going, yeah. but. It's still like as a paradox. I don't think any of the songs sound like each other, and uh, and and uh, the same things happened here. Like we have like we're working on our eighth song, and it, all of them sound completely different, and they still sound different than paradox. But it all has the same kind of congeniality to it, or you know whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, to me, uh, I've always said uh, Nocturnus, Nocturnus' AD has always been technical. But it's catchy technical stuff. It's not just wankery, you know. So, yeah, it's funny. It's like the way the guitar players write. It sounds like a simple rhythm because you can. It's you know you can like almost hum the rhythms and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of these bands they get so crazy with you can't even hum the rhythm. You know, it's like you know, exactly. That's exactly. That's not good. We have that too, of course. But we have a lot of our main rhythms. You know, they're catchy sounding, but you try to break that rhythm down and play it. It doesn't, it's sounds a lot simpler than it really is. Oh, I've seen those guys play live and I'm like, Oh, what the, you know, yeah, so. you know there's a lot more going on than, than we, it, it kind of sounds like a rhythm that you can actually hum and remember, which is the cool thing about it. You yeah, know, like, absolutely. There's like absolutely. a couple of these parts in these new songs. I find myself like, I can't quit hearing it in my head because it's so oh. stuck in my head some of these rhythms it's like wow which is a good thing you know because that's what you want uh with with your songs you want people to be able to remember what they've heard you know sometimes i've listened to albums that were the the technicality was just incredible but at the end of the album i couldn't like you know remember one riff exactly right. the way it went because right. it was so, so technical and yeah. you know that's good if that's what you're going for that's yeah. exactly what you got. But I do like to have memorable stuff. Of course. And yeah, you got to have a hook. Yeah. So they're kind of hooky rhythms, just like they were on Paradox. Uh, but but they're a lot more complicated when you watch them. Yeah, yeah. I got you. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. Right. Uh, go ahead and let you go. Uh, one last – this is a pretty funny damn question. Uh, do you play drums when the guitar player is trying to tune his guitar? Always. <laughs> <laughs> As a drummer, you have to do that. It's my job. <laughs> awesome. Hey, there you go. Great, great question, George. Great question. So, <laughs> all right. Well, again, uh, Mike, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get it, tell everybody goodbye here in a minute. But uh, I appreciate you joining me, and uh, I'll be in touch. I can see you some of those pictures that the one you hadn't seen or whatever. I'll send it to you. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll send you that Nico one too. The other. Oh one. yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see that. Awesome. I'm sitting in the side of a trailer. It's kind of funny outside in a golf course. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Again, thank you very much. All right, thank you, and it was a great interview. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> that's a real good question, George. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, if uh, anybody, uh, yeah, what y'all think? I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, I, I try to keep these a little shorter and everything, but. Uh, uh, sometimes you know you got somebody cool. I, I I think of a bunch of stuff. I'm like I gotta ask them this. I gotta ask them this and all that. So, uh, oh, but yeah. Uh, anyway, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, share the video with everybody. Tell everybody about it. Tell everybody about the channel. Uh, look out for the new Nocturnus stuff uh, that should be coming out. If you haven't picked up that Paradox album, uh, get it. It's it's. I mean, it's fucking good, man. Uh, I, I I dig it. I've been jamming it lately, just getting prepared for the uh, talk to Mike and everything. So um, uh, get that album. Uh, look out for the new stuff. Uh, go on their Instagram page. Uh, check them out. Nocturnus AD. Uh, Facebook. They have a Facebook. Nocturnus AD Facebook. Uh, support the band however you can. And, uh, uh, you know, they haven't been doing much. So help them out. Uh, and... 
Again, thanks everybody. Mark, Mark Sawick is from Impetigo. What's up, Mark? Appreciate everybody's good comments. I uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in. Uh, I will see you guys on Saturday. Oops, I messed that up. All right, see y'all later. <laughs>